could someone nicknamed Dr. Death actually have been a good guy? It's a name befitting a serial killer or maybe a pro wrestling villain. Uh, we've even talked about a serial killer here on Time Suck that had that nickname, Harold Shipman. Today, we'll be talking about another Dr. Death, Jack Kevorkian. And Jack Kevorkian would end up dedicating his life's most important work to killing people, sort of. Born in 1928 as a child of two Armenian immigrants fleeing the Armenian genocide, Kevorkian would soar past the common realm of being your average doctor and squarely into the territory of being a man on the cutting edge of something that was either, depending on your right-to-die perspective, great or terrible. Fascinated with death from a young age, Kevorkian would become best known for his staunch advocacy of a patient's right to die when they wanted to, especially for patients with incurable terminal illnesses. Out of less than $50 worth of supplies, Kevorkian fashioned a death machine he called the Thanatron, an injection contraption that, with the push of a button, administered a heart-stopping dose of the chemical potassium chloride. Kevorkian insisted in the deaths of 130 terminally ill people between 1990 and 1998 as an ardent believer in doctor-assisted suicide, sometimes called euthanasia. He believed that the Hippocratic Oath to do no harm in the case of someone who was severely, severely ill and in agony was not to prolong their suffering, but to help them find a peaceful way out of it. The state of Michigan did not agree with his viewpoint. After Kevorkian helped a woman with Alzheimer's die in the summer of 1990, he was quickly charged with murder. But then the case was dropped due to the fact that Michigan didn't have a law explicitly against physician-assisted suicide. They'd quickly pass a law against it, and as Kevorkian kept offering his services, authorities kept arresting him. Kevorkian was tried four times for assisting suicides between May 1994 and June 1997. Over and over, when the cases went to trial, the jury would be shocked to hear the families of the dead testifying for Dr. Kevorkian's defense. They said they were glad that their loved ones had gotten some final control in the middle of their illnesses, that Kevorkian had helped their loved ones have the dignified death they wanted. But at the same time, Kevorkian was cocky as shit. He could get a wee bit self-righteous, an attitude that doesn't often play out well in the court of public opinion, doesn't often sit well with the judge or jury either. As the cases kept coming and he kept getting more and more national exposure, he would treat patients, help them die, and openly flaunt the law. When he showed up for his later trials, he did so in homemade pilgrim-like costumes to protest laws against euthanasia he felt were old-fashioned, outdated, puritanical. He went as far as to air an assisted suicide on 60 Minutes, daring law enforcement to stop him. And then they did. On November 25, 1998, Kevorkian was charged with second-degree murder and the delivery of a controlled substance, the lethal injection. Because Kevorkian's license to practice medicine had been revoked eight years previously, he was not legally allowed to possess the controlled substance. After just a two-day trial, the Michigan jury found Kevorkian guilty of second-degree homicide. Judge Jessica Cooper sentenced Kevorkian to serve 10 to 25 years in prison. He would serve eight years before being released on parole with conditions that stipulated that he could no longer help anyone die and couldn't be an expert opinion when the news covered the controversial subject. Interesting stipulations. Why was the judge so afraid he'd keep talking about this subject? Shouldn't we be free to talk about whatever we want in a society that openly places so much value on freedom, a place that literally calls itself the land of the free? And this gag order was placed upon him, even though, according to his patients and their families, Kevorkian had done nothing wrong. He had been helping them, hadn't he? But was he really helping? Kevorkian was known by his colleagues to be a bit of a mad scientist type, going back to when he was experimenting with blood transfusions from corpses in the 1970s. He'd also advocated for doing live dissections of convicted criminals. And with his ideas, there was a lot of pushback from those around him, often on the grounds of the slippery slope argument. Once we start killing people legally who meet certain right-to-die criteria, where does assisted euthanasia stop? Do we go from a society that does so much to try to stop suicide to one that promotes it, holds it in high regard, expects it in certain situations? Was Dr. Death a good guy, a good doctor? We dissect the strange and complicated life of Dr. Kevorkian, analyze the right to die argument, and examine how America views the notion of mortality right now on another morally gray edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. (laughs) You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, Meat Sacks, and welcome to the Cult of the Curious. I'm Dan Cummins, the Master Sucker, Bo Jangles Pooper Scooper, Dr. Death's Laboratory Janitor, Lucifina, a uh, boudoir photographer, 
and you are listening to Time Suck. Hail Nimrod, hail Lucifina, praise Bo Jangles, and glory be to Triple M. Uh, recorded this episode right before tickets for our Wet Hot Bad Magic Summer Camp go on sale. I hope there are none left by the time you hear this, but if there are, you can find them at badmagicmerch.com. Come get wet and hot with me and the team this August. More details at badmagicmerch.com. It is, uh, it's crazy that we're doing this. Uh, you can also come see me in Charlotte this weekend. I'll be at the Comedy Zone this Thursday, Friday, Saturday, March 24th through the 26th. Hope I had a great time in Atlanta this last week. Uh, guessing I did. Uh, then April 15th and 16th in Tempe, Arizona. April 23rd in Missoula. Uh, that show at the Wilma almost sold out. April 28th through the 30th in Raleigh. And the rest of the spring dates. Uh, just added Springfield, Missouri, May 26th uh, through the 28th, the Blue Room, uh, Milwaukee Improv uh, in uh, June, I believe, adding that date, uh, all at dancummins.tv. Uh, last quick announcement thing, uh, some merch. This past weekend, I was digging around in Nimrod's closet, and I found a box of old PETs from when Nimrod was a principal at Times Like High School. You remember that? Uh, I found it in three different colors, so head on over to badmagicmerch.com to check them out. All the names have faded, so there's room for you to write your own in. And you can tag us on socials with hashtag Time Suck High School to relive your school pride. Uh, no visible sweat stains from what we can tell. And now for another topic. Our dear Patreon space lizards have voted in after unlocking the voting feature of the Time Suck app. The topic of death and also the strange death-focused life of Dr. Jack Kevorkian, a.k.a. Dr. Death. Depending on what side of the physician-assisted suicide debate you fall on, you might think that uh, Dr. Jack Kevorkian is a righteous hero, or you might think he's a wicked killer. On the hero side of the argument, I mean, Jack did help people. For sure he did. As a pathologist, someone studying the causes and effects of disease, he did for years and years help sick people get well. And then later, as an inventor and champion uh, for terminally ill patients' right to die, he did what almost no doctor at the time would do. He stepped up and helped people who were in a lot of pain, People typically weeks or months or sometimes just a you know few uh, short days uh, away from dying, eh, sometimes years, uh, you know, as a shell of their former selves, and he helped them find some last measure of what they perceived as dignity. Kevorkian's longtime lawyer, Jeffrey Figer, was a member of the Kevorkian is a Hero camp, and he would once say this about him. I've never met any doctor who lived by such exacting guidelines as Kevorkian. He published him in an article for the American Journal of Forensic Psychiatry in 1992. Last year, he got a committee of doctors, the Physicians of Mercy, to lay down new guidelines, which he scrupulously follows. However, Figer also stated that Kevorkian found it difficult to follow his own exacting guidelines because of, quote, persecution and prosecution, adding he's proposed these guidelines saying this is what ought to be done. These are not to be done in times of war and were at war. And he was at war with the American government. Uh, essentially, he felt that Kevorkian wanted to do everything by the books, but felt that the books were unfair and outdated. And in order to get to a place where assisted suicide was accepted, Kevorkian had to be willing to sometimes go against the law. And unlike a madman with a thirst for blood, uh, his detractors sometimes portrayed him as, Kevorkian didn't just kill people indiscriminately. He didn't end the life of anyone that asked him to because he was overcome with the desire to kill a bloodlust. He said himself that he declined four out of five suicide requests on the grounds that the patient needed more treatment or that their medical records had to be more thoroughly checked. But critics have said that his methods were not as foolproof as he thought. According to a report by the Detroit Free Press, 60% of the patients who died with Kevorkian's help were not terminally ill, and at least 13 had not complained of pain. This, this report further asserted that Kevorkian's counseling was too brief, with at least 19 patients dying less than 24 hours after first meeting Kevorkian, and that there was no psychiatric exam in at least 19 cases, five of which involved people with histories of depression. Though Kevorkian was sometimes alerted that the patient was unhappy for reasons other than their medical condition. Kevorkian thought that the free press, though, had an axe to grind against him, that they were wrong about those stats and assessment. In 1992, Kevorkian himself wrote that it was always necessary to consult a psychiatrist when performing assisted suicides because a person's mental state is of paramount importance. And during his trials, people who wanted him to help them die testified that because of his rigorous standards, including psychological testing, he did not help them. And families of people he did help die testified that he did, in fact, put patients through rigorous screening before assisting them. 
Uh, the Detroit Free Press also reported that Kevorkian failed to refer at least 17 patients to a pain specialist after they complained of chronic pain and sometimes failed to obtain a complete medical record for his patients. With at least three autopsies of suicides, Kevorkian had assisted on uh, showing the person who committed suicide to have no physical signs of disease. And that one woman, Rebecca Badger, a patient of Kevorkian's and a mentally troubled drug abuser, had been mistakenly diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. The report also stated that Janet Atkins, Kevorkian's first euthanasia patient, had been chosen without Kevorkian ever speaking to her, only with her husband, and that when Kevorkian first met Atkins two days before her assisted suicide, he made no real effort to discover whether Miss, uh, Miss Atkins wished to end her life. As the Michigan Court of Appeals put it in a 1995 ruling upholding an order against Kevorkian's activity. Uh, this based on other coverage of Miss Atkins, uh, Mrs. Atkins does not seem to be true though. Kevorkian was polarizing and it seemed like those who didn't like him really went out of their way to demonize him. And there was a lot of people in Michigan who did not like him, including members of the Detroit Free Press, it seems. Uh, people at The Economist also didn't seem to care for him. The Economist would say studies of those who sought out Dr. Kevorkian, however, suggest that though many had a worsening illness, it was not usually terminal. Autopsy showed five people had no disease at all. Little over a third were in pain. Some presumably suffered from no more than hypochondria or depression. Again, looking at all this uh, years later, I, I, I think that those uh, he helped, you know, suffered from a lot more than hypochondria. Uh, others would say that maybe Kevorkian was right to help patients out when he did, but that his history of medical experiments made him a shady figure in their eyes. And there's definitely something to that argument. On um, page two, uh, 214 of Prescription, Medicide, the Goodness of Planned Death, Kevorkian wrote that assisting suffering or doomed persons to kill themselves was merely the first step an early distasteful professional obligation. What I find most satisfying is the prospect of making possible the performance of invaluable experiments or other beneficial medical acts under conditions that this first unpleasant step can help establish in a world uh, obituary. That last word was a word, uh, a term of his own coinage uh, used to describe the pseudo profession of medical death delivery. So he can, he can come across a little bit as a, uh, is a Nazi doctor, a medical experimenter in some of his writings, which, uh, you know, obviously is off-putting. Dr. Kevorkian was kind of obsessed with death, and most people seem to find that obsession pretty fucking morbid. Makes him uncomfortable. Jack made a whole nation uncomfortable. For years, Kevorkian experimented with things that other doctors wouldn't touch, like blood transfusions from corpses. I did not know that before this week. Uh, Proposing things like doing live dissections on convicted criminals so they could be uh, used to benefit society. In a journal article, The Last Fearsome Taboo, Medical Aspects of Planned Death, Kevorkian also detailed uh, anesthetizing, experimenting on, and utilizing the organs of a disabled newborn as a token of, quote, daring and highly imaginative research that would be possible beyond the constraints of traditional but outmoded, hopelessly inadequate, and essentially irrelevant ethical codes now sustained for the most part by vacuous sentimental reverence. And writing things like that, you know, fucking terrified people. Probably uh, rightfully so. I mean, dude <laughs> dude was definitely a member of the fuck your feelings crowd. Coldly logical. Not an emotional nurturer. A uh, bit of a mad scientist. I think more than anything else, what made so many people uncomfortable when it came to Jack was his ability to casually talk about and scientifically explore something that terrifies most of us. Our own inevitable death. So how are we going to tackle this very complicated subject today? Uh, first, we'll take a look at death and suicide throughout the ages. What meat sacks have thought at various times and places about the best ways to deal with death and what death means. There's some wacky shit we're going to dig into there. That's fun. Uh, Then we'll take a closer look at assisted suicide, the history of various pro and against movements, and then run down the arguments for both sides of the coin. Uh, Finally, before we recap, we'll of course uh, get into the life and work of Jack Kevorkian. In an experiment field, uh, there are some weird experiments, uh, blood-soaked time-suck timeline. So let us begin Uh, Today's topic takes us straight into the heart of something we don't often want to talk about, want to think about, death. We spend a lot of our lives either ignoring the knowledge that death is one day coming for us, right, don't we? It's it's an incredibly upsetting topic for, I would say, the overwhelming majority of people in the culture I'm a part of, at least. American society considered by many academics to firmly be a death-denying culture. In general, we don't like to think about it, talk about it. We don't like to acknowledge death as an inevitable reality. While logically we understand that we will die someday, uh, it is generally a topic that is too uncomfortable to discuss or really even dwell on for too long, and we sweep it under the rug. 
With death, uh, you know, when death does approach or arrive, it, as it inevitably must, Americans often use euphemisms, cute little phrases that make it sound, you know, less, uh, less final, passed on, passed away, uh, even past, you know, just in current use. People don't really die, they expire or kick the bucket. They go to their reward, breathe their last, cash in their chips, meet their maker, depart this life, give up the ghost. You know, there's other terms we use as avoidances. Uh, insurance companies advertise plans designed to meet your final expenses. Uh, once death arrives, its victims are not dead. No, not really. They're, they're loved ones. They're departed. The deceased, the late so-and-so. Uh, British historian Arnold Toynbee even once remarked that death was un-American. America is a youth culture that emphasizes beauty, virility, ambition, athletic prowess. The old and the sick, those closer to death, historically been cast aside to the shadows. Go hide somewhere! Ugh! Watching you die reminds me that I will die! And that doesn't make me feel good at all! So please, spare me uncomfortable feelings! Let me make your death about me! Do me a favor! Don't cry or moan too much, it's, um, it's upsetting! Please make it quick! For the, good of the, for the good of the rest of us. Uh, it's almost as if within this culture, aging, decline, death, or things that happen to other people as well. Right? Preferably in other countries. Not, not here. Not in the US. Come on. We're so alive. We're, so, we're strong. We're going to live forever. Right? We're going to figure out how to conquer death before we have to face it. If death feels close, we're just going to drink more fucking Whipple. Fuck the Grim Reaper edition. Woo! Death isn't real. It's something, you know, we just see on television. It's, it's Hollywood. Showbiz. We rarely stare in the face. We like, we like to keep death at a distance. Once someone does die, the, there are pretty specific standards associated with how we deal with death. And it's very detached now, much more than it used to be with human civilization. You know, from the funeral parlor process to the ritual of burying our dead to how we deal with matters of inheritance, property left behind, or technology advances in care, right? have worked very hard in recent years to make death so much more remote than it used to be. While you probably would have seen a dead body, several even, as a young person in 1800s America, Many no longer confront the reality of death, if they're lucky, until their grandparents or parents die. And people don't die at home as often as they used to, right? Instead, they die in nursing homes, hospitals, hospices, where every effort is made to make death seem peaceful and final, and not in your house, not in my neighborhood. I've personally never been to an open casket funeral, ever. Never been to a morgue, never come across a dead body one time. I've, I've driven past some traffic accidents, so I guess, okay, maybe I have from a distance. Specifically, some motor, motorcycle accidents where I assumed the still body on the highway uh, in front of the first responders was no longer alive. But that's the closest I've ever come. I've watched some horrible VHS Faces of Death tapes when I was a kid, but never literally stared death in the face. Uh, add into the cultural mix of how someone should die given the technology available to them in this day and age, say prolonging life as long as possible on the chance that some miracle cure comes out to save your loved one, and you get a pretty death-adverse culture here. We don't want to give up. We, want, we fight cancer, right? We, to be a survivor, we beat death. You know, we beat an illness. But we haven't always been this way. Even though all societies throughout history have realized that death is the certain fate of human beings, different cultures have responded to it in very different ways. Through the ages, attitudes towards death and dying have changed and continue to change, shaped by religious, intellectual, philosophical beliefs. Dr. Kevorkian would think that the best way to encounter death was to face it head on by giving the individual some autonomy in their death. Not struggling as we often do to prolong life at any cost, no matter how poor the quality. For most of us, I imagine, that's not how we see it. We always want to know if there's one more treatment, one more intervention, one more surgery. We just don't want to let go. Sometimes even if it prolongs our you know, suffering our, or our loved one's suffering. I've maybe had different role models in this uh, regard than some. My, uh, my family, at least on my mom's side, uh, uh, kind of death embracing in a weird way. Uh, when my great grandma Stell was 95, I remember telling her uh, how great it would be to soon be celebrating her 100th birthday. And she did not share my enthusiasm at all. Uh, she said something to the effect of, I hope not. My husband is gone. All my friends are gone. I wake up every morning thinking, why am I still here? I'm ready to go. Like She was very like, what? No, I'm not fucking happy to be alive anymore. Uh, pretty mo- morbid in a sense, but so honest. She passed. She died sometime the next year. Uh, well, you know, actually my brother-in-law, Jared, he killed her. I think. I can't prove it. He didn't kill her. But saying that he did was maybe the most poorly received inside my family joke I've ever done. Uh, he was with her when she died, uh, when she fell and broke her hip and had to be taken to the hospital where she then died. And I may have jokingly in front of my family, asked him to please not kill any more of my grandparents. And then my sister may have taken me aside and told me that he felt really, really bad. And that when I say things like that, it's super fucked up and please don't do it again. Uh, Grandma Stella's son-in-law, uh, Papa Ward, who passed away at the end of 2020, uh, he was healthy for 87 of his 88 years. 
And then after doctors told him there was nothing more that could be done to make him feel better, no surgery, no treatment, his legs had gotten real weak last few months of his life. He just couldn't walk very far at all, which was very tough for a guy who'd been so independent. He'd been fixing his roof, still getting his own firewood just a year or two before. And he told me straight up, this is no way to live. He did not want to drag on like that. He wanted to go at that point. And I respected that, you know, hard to hear, but respected it. Why, uh, why long to hang on and just suffer? And when he did die, yeah, it was fucking sad, but I was happy for him as well. I would have hated to see him hang on for another year or two in misery, a shell of his former self. I would have hated it because he would have hated it. It would have felt selfish to watch him hang around in pain like that, to watch his pride take a needless beating just so we uh, wouldn't have to deal with our feelings of missing him. Personally, when I go, gotta hope it's fucking quick. Uh, but statistically, it probably won't be, right? Death isn't as sudden or as peaceful for the majority of Americans as we might think. Sorry, Pete. Sorry to be the bearer of some doom and gloom here. Uh, if you get too sad, just remind yourself, Dan is a liar. Death is nothing but an illusion. The magic of Hollywood. Come on. Uh, according to Stanford School of Medicine, about 2 million Americans will die this year and less than 10% of the population will experience a sudden or relatively rapid death due to cardiac diseases, uh, trauma, etc. Most will be diagnosed and live and endure life with a chronic illness for a prolonged period of time before transitioning into death. Most patients diagnosed with a terminal illness live with the implications and endure the associated symptoms for months, if not years before dying. These might be physical symptoms, uh, pain, uh, dys dyspnea, aka labored breathing, uh, nausea, vomiting, pruritus, uh, pruritus, anorexia, fatigue, constipation, immobility, or psychological symptoms like depression, anxiety, panic, or even post-traumatic stress. Uh, any given year, a lot of Americans deal with terminal illnesses. In 2020, an estimated 1,806,590 new cases of cancer were diagnosed in the U.S. alone, and an estimated 606,520 people died from the disease. Uh, the rate of new cases of cancer based on 2013 through 2017 cases, 442.4 per 100,000 men and women per year. Estimated national expenditures for cancer care in the U.S. in 2018 were $150.8 billion. In future years, costs are likely to increase as the population ages and more people get cancer. Costs are also likely to increase as new, often more expensive treatments are adopted as standards of care. How much of that money is extending the lives of people who are miserable and who have no chance of getting better? There are, of course, uh, other terminal illnesses. In 2020, as many as 5.8 million Americans were living with Alzheimer's disease, Younger people may get Alzheimer's, but uh, it's very rare. The number of people living with the disease doubles every five years beyond the age of 65. This number projected to triple to 14 million people by 2060. Uh, one more two common diseases. Talk about ALS, uh, amaya, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, named after that Yankee baseball legend. Uh, ALS is a progressive neurodegenerative disease that affects nerve cells in the brain and spinal cord leaving a person progressively more and more paralyzed. Uh, it's brutal. And there's currently no cure. Once ALS starts, it almost always progresses, eventually taking away the ability to walk, dress, write, speak, swallow, breathe, uh, greatly shortening the lifespan. Most people who develop ALS are between the ages of 40 and 70, uh, with an average age of 55 at the time of diagnosis. However, cases of the disease do occur in persons in their 20s and 30s. I'll be talking about one of those in a second. Uh, only half of all people affected with ALS will live at least three or more years after diagnosis. 20% live five years or more. Up to 10% will live more than 10 years. Uh, I once went to a wedding about 20 years ago in Spokane, Washington. And also at the wedding was Steve Gleason. Name might be familiar to you. Same age as me within a few months. Uh, grew up in Spokane where I was living at the time. Uh, then he went to play football for the New Orleans Saints, which he was doing when I saw him. Uh, special team star made a legendary blocked punt play for the Saints in their first home game after Hurricane Katrina. There's a statue outside the stadium about it now. When he was in high school, he was a star linebacker, incredible power hitter for the baseball team. Uh, I didn't write this in my notes, but I think it was Gonzaga Prep. Uh, dude was a hell of an athlete. He was jacked when I saw him. Sports were his life. Couldn't have looked healthier. Couldn't have looked more alive. But then after a long period of declining health, he was diagnosed with ALS in 2011 when he was just 33. He was given no more than five years to live. Well, he's still alive 10 years out, and he seems, based on his Instagram post, to be very fulfilled. But ALS has robbed him of, and I'm not positive of the order of how all of this was robbed from him, his ability to walk, to talk, to move his arms, to move his hands, to eat, to even breathe on his own. 
He now is in a highly specialized motorized wheelchair. He is able to type and also to, you know, uh, move his wheelchair by eye movement alone. He can still hear, he can still see, he can stare at different points on the specialized tablet attached to his wheelchair facing him. And that allows him based on just pupil uh, position to move his wheelchair. And you can use the same ability to type. It's fucking wild. It's incredible what Steve's doing. He, he's inc- uh, an inspirational, you know, but would you want to live like that with the, with the ability to only control the movement of your eyes? Would you want to have to live like that, right? If he, if he wanted to die, he would have to have someone help him die. He would not be able to do it on his own. And if you wanted to die, uh, would you want society to label you a quitter, to refuse you that right, right? You're someone who's given up because they're weak. Should everyone be expected to persevere in the face of almost unimaginable adversity like Steve Gleason? Or should you be given the freedom to say, no, thank you. I've enjoyed my time here. This is not for me. I would rather not. I would like to leave now. Uh, Goodbye, everyone. It's interesting to think about, right? Uh, We talked about so much death. Uh, in the history of this podcast, genocide, serial killings, uh, but we've never really addressed it head on, have we? And doing so, I got to say, it feels so much fucking sadder than all the deaths we have talked about here before. I, like everyone listening, you know, am a product of the culture that I happen to be born into. An American death culture ignoring the prevalence of terminal illnesses and an almost pathological denial of impending death has left me, like I imagine many of you, with a very strong aversion to want to discuss any of this. It's very uncomfortable. Uh, But Kevorkian, another American, did not share this aversion at all. Uh, Dr. K was influenced uh, largely by his parents' experience of death back in Armenia, by tales of the genocide, and also through his own academic studies, uh, where he'd be influenced by the death culture of the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans. So let's look into this history now of how we humans have dealt with morality across the world, Uh, see where he got some of his, uh, you know, perspective According to archaeological records, we know that around 2.5 to 3 million years ago, humans began to bury their dead. At some point before that, uh, I guess where you fell was, you know, where you laid to rot. And then I imagine you were at least dragged away from wherever your fellow tribe members ate and slept. And then at some point you were buried. Paleolithic corpses accompanied by stone tools and parts of animals were laid in holes in the ground, sometimes given, quote, extra protection. Those sources uh, have not indicated that we found what that means. Uh, I'm sure it varied. Sacrifices, the presentation of offerings to higher beings or to the dead, appear as early as the Middle Paleolithic period, which lasted from 250,000 to 30,000 years ago. Uh, Pits with some animal bones uh, have been found in the vicinity of burial sites, leading archaeologists to think that ancient humans were making sacrifices to the dead. According to this, uh, or excuse me, around the 7th millennium BCE, so 9,000 years ago, people were practicing ancestor worship, according to evidence discovered at Jericho in Palestine. Archaeologists found several skulls in a separate room, some of them covered with a plaster modeling of faces. They believe these skulls were connected to the veneration of ancestors, which in many skull cults were associated with bringing increased fertility to the land. As human civilization began to develop, uh, early humans began to think about what, if anything, lives on after death, what many would call the soul. And religion was born, in part as a means to answer that question. Ancient Hebrews, who lived from, you know, uh, 1020 to 86 BCE, while acknowledging the existence of the soul, were not preoccupied with the afterlife. They thought it was pretty much dust unto dust. You're here, and then you're not. Uh, By contrast, early Egyptians, who lived from 2900 to 950 BCE, thought that the preservation of the dead body, mummification, guaranteed a happy afterlife, very much believed in the afterlife. They believed a person had a dual soul, the ka, the ba. The Ka was the spirit that dwelled near the body, whereas the Ba was the vitalizing soul that lived on in the realm of the dead. The ancient Sumerians, whose religion extended even earlier than the Egyptians, also believed in some form of an afterlife, where we lived as a shadowy imitation of our life on uh, this realm. The ancient Chinese, at least as early as 2500 BC, also believed in a soul, one part of which continued to exist after the death of the body. That part, uh, you know, continued to exist, uh, uh, was worshipped by its descendants. And all this belief in the afterlife, it affected how these cultures cared for their dead. The ancient Greeks believed that the gods would punish them if they didn't bury their dead properly. And even though reincarnation is usually associated with Asian religions, some Greeks were followers of Orphism, a religion that taught that the soul underwent many reincarnations until purification was achieved. But the vast majority of Greeks believed that after death, the psyche, a person's vital essence, or psyche, lived on in the underworld. Greek writers like Homer populated their stories with travels to the underworld and expressed a belief in eternal judgment and retribution after death. 
This period also saw the rise of Greek philosophers who were also concerned what you should do when death was on the horizon, including what suicide meant. In general, the pagan world, both Roman and Greek, had a pretty relaxed attitude towards the concept of suicide. One early Greek historical person to commit suicide was Empe- Empedocles, <laughs> uh, around 434 BCE. One of his beliefs was that uh, you know, uh, death was a transformation. It is possible this idea influences suicide. Uh, Empedocles died, according to his ancient writings, by throwing himself into the Sicilian volcano Mount Etna. And that is fucking dramatic. I hope his transformation worked out for him. At the very least, he transformed uh, from an able-bodied dude into a pile of dead, busted-up meat at the bottom of that volcano pit. Uh, Other philosophers did not take it quite that far. The Greek philosopher Pythagoras opposed euthanasia because it might disturb the soul's journey towards final purification as planned by the gods. On the contrary, Socrates and Plato believed people should, you know, could, should choose to end their life if they were no longer useful to themselves or the state. Socrates even put his money where his mouth was, choosing to drink hemlock rather than be executed by the state for his unconventional teachings. Great example of a right to die choice. Knowing that a painful and humiliating, uh, you know, uh, public death was very likely in his future, uh, he chose to leave privately and peacefully. Like Socrates and Plato, the classical Romans believed a person suffering from intolerable pain or an incurable illness should have the right to choose a good death. They considered euthanasia a mode of dying that allowed a person's right to take control of an intolerable situation and distinguished it from suicide, an act considered to be a shirking of one's responsibilities to one's family and to humankind. Ancient Greeks, man, so smart in so many ways, uh, planting those seeds for Western civilization to grow so long ago. Uh, In Rome, suicide was never a general offense of the law. Uh, The whole approach to the question was essentially pragmatic. It was specifically forbidden in three cases. Those accused of capital crimes, don't kill yourselves, we're supposed to kill you. Uh, Soldiers, uh, you know, you go die in the battlefield, you know, not uh, by your own hand. And slaves, don't, uh, you know, uh, go ruining somebody's property. The reason behind all these three was the same. It was uneconomic for these people to die, right? If the accused killed themselves prior to trial and conviction, then the state lost the right to seize their property, a loophole that was only closed by Emperor Emperor, uh, Domitian. Oh my gosh, these fucking Roman names. I always hate them. Uh, Domitian, Domitian, Emperor Domitian in the first century CE, who decreed that those who died prior to trial were without legal heirs. So, you know, pretty fucked up. Kill yourself before we kill you and you don't get to pass on your property to your family. Uh, The suicide of a soldier was treated on the same basis as desertion. And if a slave killed himself or herself within six months of purchase, the master could claim a full refund from the former owner. Okay. Uh, But in general, outside of those three situations, suicide, not a big deal to the Romans. Socrates, Plato, the Romans would be big influences on Dr. K. Uh, Not sure the following death cultures also influenced him, but worth taking a look at to gain more perspective on how we humans have historically looked at death and the right to die. Some Mongolian and Tibetan cultures practice, and some still practice, sky burial, the process of placing the body of the deceased on a high, unprotected place to be consumed by wildlife and the elements, to return to nature. This is part of the Vajrayana uh, Buddhist belief of, the, of transmigration of spirits, which teaches that respecting the body after death is needless. It is now just an empty vessel. During the European Middle Ages, death, with, it, with its accompanying agonies, accepted as a destiny everyone shared, and dealing with it happened as a community. Death became a public ritual that involved specific preparations, the presence of family, friends, and neighbors, as well as music, food, drinks, and games. The social aspect of these customs kept death public and tame through the enactment of familiar ceremonies that comforted more, comforted mourners. Uh, while some early rituals, death rituals, were similar to the funeral rites we still employ today, other rituals were uh, weird as fuck. In some parts of Europe, human skulls were soaked in alcohol to create a tincture called the King's Drops that was said to be good for gout, dropsy, aka edema, uh, swelling caused by fluid in your body's tissues, and all fevers, putrid, or uh, pestilential, among other ailments. King Charles II of England allegedly paid 6,000 pounds for a personal recipe in the 17th century. What? Imagine doing that today. Just, damn, looks like you got the gout. Uh, Don't worry, though. I got just a thing for that. Uh, when my grandpa passed, uh, we, we boiled the flesh off his head and then soaked his skull in alcohol and made ourselves a little potion. Here, t- take a few tablespoons of uh, grandpa's skull juice. You'll be feeling better in no time. Uh, some people also used to believe that the blood of the freshly executed was a health tonic and they would pay executioners a few coins to drink it warm from the gallows. Oh, yum, yum. Oh, drink up. Uh, doing this documented in Germany, Sweden, and Denmark as recently as the 19th century in a few cases. 
There were all kinds of superstitious beliefs about the magical power of corpses in Europe. Uh, People thought being touched by the hand of a newly dead man could cure ailments. Just before the corpse of James Morgan was cut down at a hanging in the city of Maidstone, England in 1819, the hangman enabled a young woman to stand on the waiting coffin uh, in order to be able to reach up and have the hand of the hanging corpse pass over a swelling on her throat. For fuck's sake. Oh, me, oh, me throat feels better already, it does. A dead man's hand. Nothing gets you sweating down like a dead man's hand. This wasn't that long ago. Uh, many places in England in the 16th, 17th, 18th, early 19th centuries, the hangman would take the hand of the corpse and administer rubbings <laughs> to patients who sometimes stood in line for that shit at the scaffold. This happened enough that the condemned were aware that their bodies might be exploited minutes after their death, and some would ask, ask their executioners to not allow it. In 1815, while on the scaffold of Newgate Prison in London, uh, waiting his hanging, John Binstead, uh, found guilty of forgery, requested of the presiding clergyman that his hands would not be made available to those seeking a cure for wens, a.k.a. cysts. How the fuck did they come up with that? Who thought of that? Some dipshit British healer, some witch doctor, some fucking shaman, something, I don't know. Made up some bullshit. Just caught on, I guess. You're fake, Dr. Tallywack. Look at, look at me neck lumps. Sorry, my lady, but as I told you, I need the proper medicine. I have not the proper potions to cure your neck lumps, but I could easily cure them if I had the, um, uh, the hand of a corpse. All right. We'll see if that works. We'll see if you're worth it. My me uncle passed no more than three moons back. I'll dig him up. I'll get you the hand. No, the hand must be um, uh, fresher. Fresher than that. The fresh hand of a dead man is the only one that works. All right, then. There's an execution tomorrow. I'll get you that hand. And maybe the doctor was like, ah, fuck. She's going to be pissed when this bullshit doesn't work. But then it did work through some crazy coincidence, right? And she told everyone, oh, you can get rid of your neck lumps lickety split. Just need a fresh dead man's hand to rub on your neck. <laughs> this is so insane. Some of these things. Uh, while some superstitions, likely pagan origin, like the hand shit I just talked about, slipped through the cracks. In general, the Roman Catholic Church, with its emphasis on eternal life of the soul in heaven or hell, uh, held great power over medieval Europeans' notions of death and funeral rites, etc. This extended to you know control over the concept of suicide as well. The church would excommunicate people who attempted suicide. And those who died by suicide were even buried outside of consecrated graveyards. Think about how crazy that is. The burial banishment also incorporated into a lot of Protestant churches' uh, belief systems. A lot of old cemeteries in the U.S., especially on the East Coast, mostly on the East Coast, uh, still have gravestones lying just outside the borders of the church's original graveyard boundaries. That'll teach people. You want to be buried next to Ma and Pa? Well, then you have to follow our death rules. We're not just going to punish you in this life. We're going to punish you when you're dead, too. And the dead were punished. Uh, often, sometimes in, in medieval Europe, uh, a criminal ordinance, this is so ridiculous, issued by King Louis XIV of France in 1670, uh, severely punished corpses. The dead person's body was, dr- <laughs> they committed suicide, the dead person's body was drawn through the streets, face down, then hung or thrown on a fucking garbage heap. <laughs> and all the person's property was confiscated. Jesus Christ. There's so much madness in our species. The leader of France demanded that. They, they think that life is so hard in France? They should just kill themselves, huh? Not without punishment from me. Tells my kingdom, anyone who kills themselves will be killed again by me. I will have their dead body dragged through the streets until they are more dead. I will then hang them and then throw them in the trash. Only I can kill the French people. Fucking m- maniacal. Uh, the leader is doing that. From the 14th through the 16th centuries, Europe experienced new directions in economics, the arts, uh, social, scientific, and political thought, but death still mostly regarded in superstitious or religious terms. Over thoughts on suicide, at least by some, were being discussed in new ways. This is good. Thomas More, the English humanist, wrote in 1616 that a person afflicted with disease can, quote, free himself from this bitter life. Since my death, he will put an end, not to enjoyment, but to torture. It will be a pious and holy action. Uh, English poet philosopher John Donne's work, uh, Baia Thena, oh my gosh, Baia Thatanatos, fuck this guy, uh, Greek for life and death, was uh, pu- published in 1608, contained one of the first modern defenses of suicide, proving that some suicides could be good because, according to his interpretations, some people in the Bible had essentially committed suicide, such as Jesus, Samson, Saul, a little controversial, uh, but for society overall, suicide is still not considered a good thing to do, especially for religious re- reasons. 
though some people tried to find a way around it. In the late 17th, early 18th centuries, loopholes were invented to avoid the damnation that was promised by most Christian doctrine as a penalty of suicide. One famous and horrific example of someone who wished to end their life but avoid the eternity of being you know, sent to hell, burning in hell, uh, Christina Johanstata uh, died in 1740. She was a Swedish murderer, hangy bangy, uh, who killed a child in Stockholm with the sole purpose of being executed. Seriously, she cut a kid's fucking head off with an ax so she wouldn't go to hell. Why? Uh, well, mostly because she was seriously mentally ill. She was clearly depressed, had isolated herself from society for quite some time before this. The love of her life, her fiance had died. She lost all will to live, wanted to follow him to the grave. But because she'd been taught that people who complete suicide go to hell, she thought uh, her fi- fiance was definitely in heaven. Uh, so that's not an option. She's not going to go to hell. So she decided, okay, I can just kill a kid and then beg for God's forgiveness before being executed. And that gets me into heaven. Many a death row inmate. I focus on the same loophole. How fucking idiotic and totally fucked. Uh, she is an example of the, those who seek suicide through execution by committing a murder, uh, like a similar to suicide by cop. Uh, by the late 18th century, there was more of a shift from a religious to a more scientific exploration of death and suicide in the Western world, based largely in the rational thought of the Enlightenment. David Hume denied that suicide was a crime as it affected no one and was potentially to the advantage of the individual. In his 1777 Essays on Suicide and the Immortality of the Soul, he rhetorically asked, why should I prolong a miserable, a miserable existence because of some frivolous advantage which the public may perhaps receive from me? Despite more openness to dying before your time, so to speak, death itself was still scary and new medical knowledge only meant more of an obsession for those who wanted to figure out how and why death happened. In 18th century, Europeans with new technical knowledge sometimes built coffins with contraptions to enable any prematurely buried person to survive and communicate from the grave. What if they wake up? Uh, Despite new scientific knowledge, there was still a lot of superstition. In 19th century Europe and America, the dead were carried out of the house feet first. I love this. In order to prevent the spirit from looking back into the house and beckoning another member of the family to follow them or uh, also so they couldn't see where they were going. And that way they wouldn't be able to find the house again. (laughs) I love just the lack of logic and things like that. Like like I love the belief that, uh, you know, ghosts are real. You know, I actually am someone who believes in ghosts. but Holy shit, I guess uh, in this situation, they're so fucking dumb, right? Like, yeah, they're real, but God, they're fucking stupid. Like, they can't even figure out how to get back into their own house if you just take out their dead body feet first. Where, where, where is it? I didn't look as I left. Uh, mirrors also covered so the soul would not get trapped and be left unable to pass to the other side. Fucking stupid ghosts getting trapped in mirrors. Family photographs also sometimes turn face down to prevent any of the close relatives and friends of the deceased from being possessed by the spirit of the dead. Uh, Also very creepy, Uh, Victorians often took photos of dead loved ones as part of their grieving process. These post-mortem photographs became keepsakes that were displayed in homes, uh, sent to friends and relatives, (laughs) worn inside lockets. Oh, sweet Jesus. I wonder if anyone ever had some like dark humor fun with that. I don't think so, but like what, like did anyone ever put anything inside the corpse's mouth to, to prop it up into some kind of like super creepy, like just way too big dead smile? And if they did do that, did they also just maybe like, like glue the eyelids open, like really wide open. So it looked like they were like weirdly excited about their new situation. That's so funny to me. Some big frame photo in someone's living room, just dead, dead, with just a huge manic smile, really wide open eyes. Like you just heard some great, but shocking news. What? I'm fucking dead. Oh, that, well, that's wonderful news. Uh, also at this time, family members would typically prepare the corpse for viewing in the, in the home, not in a funeral parlor. Uh, That practice would change during the late 19th century, thank God, uh, when professional undertakers took over the job of preparing and burying the dead. They provided services such as readying the corpse for viewing and burial, building the coffin, digging the grave, uh, directing the funeral procession. Professional embalming, cosmetic restoration of bodies became widely available, right? Make them look alive. Looks too, it's too sad if they look dead. Uh, All carried out in a funeral parlor where bodies were then viewed instead of in the home. And so, you know, we really began to distance ourselves from death now. Cemeteries changed too to do that. Uh, Before the early 19th century, American cemeteries were uh, typically unsanitary, overcrowded, weed-filled places that smelled strongly of decay. Uh, That began to change in 1831 when the Massachusetts Horticultural Society purchased 72 acres of fields, ponds, trees, and gardens in Cambridge and built uh, Mount Auburn Cemetery. This cemetery was to become a model for the landscape garden cemetery in the U.S. that we typically see today. 
These cemeteries, you know, were tranquil places where those grieving could visit the graves of loved ones and find comfort in the beautiful surroundings. Look at the pretty flowers. Don't think about Nana. You know, they wouldn't have to smell Nana rotting. Oh, God, I can't even imagine going to a fucking nasty cemetery where you just smell decay. Then with mass printing getting cheaper and becoming more and more common in the 19th century, instructions for how to mourn the dead started to be published. So-called mourning manuals became available after 1830, which comforted the grieving with the concept that the deceased were released from worldly cares in heaven and that they would be reunited there with other deceased loved ones. Also in the 19th century, so weird death influenced fashion. The deadly lung disease tuberculosis, called consumption at the time, was pervasive during the 19th century in Europe and the U.S., as we've discussed in previous episodes. Uh, you know, consumption caused sufferers to develop a certain appearance, an extreme pallor, thinness, with a look often described as haunted that then became fashionable, represented in poetry and literature as a sort of archetype. By the mid-19th century, the romanticizing of death took on a new twist in the U.S. Spiritualism, in which the living communicate directly with the dead, began in 1848 in the U.S. with the Fox sisters, Margaret and Catherine, who lived in Hydesville, New York. We talked about the Fox sisters a couple times before in Time Suck. Uh, the sisters claimed to have communicated with the spirit of a man murdered by a former tenant in their house. The story spread like wildfire, and the practice of conducting sittings to contact the dead gained instant popularity. Mediums, including the newly popular Fox sisters, were supposedly sensitive to vibrations from the disembodied souls that temporarily lived in the part of the spirit world just outside the Earth's limits. This belief and practice continued to spread during the Civil War. Virtually everyone had lost a son, husband, or other loved one during that war. Some survivors wanted assurances that their loved ones were okay. Others were simply curious about life after death. Many of those who had drifted away from traditional Christianity embraced this new spiritualism, which claimed that the, there was scientific proof of survival after physical death. Make us feel better about death. Now attitudes about suicide are changing once again. By 1879, English law began to distinguish between suicide and homicide, although suicide still resulted in forfeiture of a state, which is crazy to me. Uh, it took until the mid-20th century for suicide to become legal in much of the Western world. The 20th century would see a turn to a more medicalized approach to death. The modern hospice movement was founded by Dame Cicely Saunders in England in 1967. That's so recent. Then later moved to Canada and the U.S. The hospice movement, sometimes called uh, palliative or palliative care, uh, emphasized a soothing, calming environment where patients could visit with family members and get pain relief. Uh, around that time, uh, the works of the psychiatrist Elizabeth Kubler Ross, including her 1969 book on death and dying, began to introduce a more holistic approach to death to Americans and emphasize confronting the reality of death and restoring dignity to the dying. We will talk more about uh, Kubler-Ross later in this episode. Holy shit, will we ever. Her story takes a very odd twist, and there's an interesting connection between her and Dr. Kevorkian. Uh, but first, wrapping up this section. Uh, these days, hospice can refer to a place, a freestanding facility, or designated floor in a hospital or nursing home, or to a program like hospice home care, in which a team of healthcare professionals helps the dying patient and family at home, which is very nice. Hospice teams may involve uh, physicians, nurses, social workers, pastoral counselors, trained volunteers. What a wonderful group of people. Such a noble profession, uh, noble field to work in. Hospice facilities served 621,100 people in 2000. Of these, 85.5% died while in hospice care. Nearly 80% of hospice patients were 65 years or older. 26.5% 85 years or older. Even uh, though more than half, 57.5% of those admitted to hospice care in 2000 had cancer as a primary diagnosis, patients with other primary diagnoses such as Alzheimer's disease and heart, respiratory, and kidney diseases also served by hospice. Uh, but importantly, uh, hospice workers don't intend to kill you. Hospice is for when you're already about to die naturally, months, weeks, or days out. If you have a terminal diagnosis, but you're not about to die soon naturally, but want to die before nature finally runs its course, well, that's, that's very different. Sometimes those with terminal diagnosis uh, or diagnoses, uh, now that word escapes, seek out the plural of, of di di diagnoses, I think. Anyway, they seek out doctors of physicians to help them die on their own timetable and not endure the ravages of their illness. Hence, physician assisted suicide, which is, you know, Dr. Kevorkian's life work. Uh, so what exactly is physician assisted suicide? Important to fully understand this since uh, this is what made Kevorkian infamous. Uh, initially, physician-assisted suicide specifically referred to the late 19th century Romanian practice of hiring your local doctor to literally beat you to death. You would sign a waiver, agree to have your arms tied behind your back, your doctor would put on a pair of brass knuckles and punch you in the fucking face and head until you were dead, and sometimes for quite a while after that, depending on their level of anger. Usually this was done in a barn 
or in a clearing out in the woods. And, uh, and of course, that's crazy. I'm not even sure what my brain ever put that scenario together. Basically, uh, physician-assisted suicide is having a physician help end someone's life through administering medication or providing the medication that would kill them, sometimes also called euthanasia. According to Gallup polls, the percentage of people in the U.S. who support euthanasia has risen from 36% in 1950, up to 65% in 1991, to a high of 75% in 1996, and then it went back down to 69% in 2014. And I would guess, based on my own perception of current cultural trends, that support for it is even lower now. Uh, intriguingly, terminology appears to play a role in people's perceptions. 69% in 2014 favored a law that would allow doctors to legally end a patient's life by some painless means. But the number dipped to 58% when respondents were asked whether physicians should be allowed to assist the patient to commit suicide. Man, words. So important. You just the right words to sell your message. Even if, uh, you know, two messages could mean completely the same thing, but one word differently, oh, so much more effective. Oh, the pill goes down so much easier. Uh, the 2014 Medscape Ethics Report, a survey of 17,000 U.S. doctors, found that 54% of doctors surveyed think physician-assisted suicide should be permitted, up eight percentage points from 2010. Uh, I thought the number would be even higher since doctors see so many, you know, more people's final days than most of us and see a lot more agony. Uh, back in the 90s, when support amongst the public and from doctors was even less, euthanasia would get Dr. K in a lot of trouble with the law. When he was promoting it in Michigan, it wasn't clear whether or not it was legal. These days, the Michigan euthanasia law is now limited to the designation of a patient advocate who, in accordance with the will, may request that the patient be removed from artificial life support. That's all. No actual uh, euthanasia is allowed. No physician-assisted suicide uh, is allowed. Bans on that go back almost 200 years in the U.S. In 1828, New York outlawed assisted suicide thanks to the political power of religious voters and politicians with many states and territories following. Between 1857 and 1865, a New York commission led by Dudley Field drafted a criminal code that prohibited aiding a suicide and specifically furnishing another person with any deadly weapon or poisonous drug, knowing that such person intends to use such weapon or drug in taking his own life. California codified its assisted suicide prohibition in 1874. And in 1885, the American Medical Association opposed physician-assisted suicide, saying it is an attempt to make the physician don the robes of an executioner. It's a little dramatic, but okay. Uh, 1905-1906, a bill to legalize euthanasia was defeated in the Ohio legislature by a vote of 79 to 23. 1906, a similar initiative that would legalize euthanasia, not only for terminal adults, but also for uh, rough, old-timey language uh, incoming, hideously deformed or idiotic children. Jesus Christ. Uh, that was introduced and defeated as well. After 1906, the public interest in euthanasia receded, but then came back with a bang in 1915. In the early hours of November 12, 1915, at Chicago's German-American hospital, Anna Bollinger gave birth to her fourth child, seven-pound baby boy. Baby was blue, badly deformed. After conferring with the father, the doctor awakened Harry J. Uh, Heisel Heiselden, the hospital's 45-year-old chief of staff. Heiselden diagnosed the baby with a laundry list of physical defects and predicted that the child would die shortly if the child didn't receive surgery. In a decision whose shock waves would ripple from coast to coast and mark a milestone in the history of euthanasia in America, uh, Heiselden advised against this surgery. He said it would be very painful. Chances of the child surviving would be small. And even if the child did survive, ongoing severe medical complications and pain were a certainty. The Bollingers tearly, tearfully agreed. And on November 16th, uh, Heiselden called a news conference to announce that rather than operate, he would merely stand by passively and let nature complete its bungled job. The child died the next day amid growing controversy. Heiselden got more Americans than ever before talking about euthanasia. The publicity surrounding his professional conduct inspired other Americans to speak out in favor of letting more old time, very callous language coming, severely deformed infants die for the good of society. Jesus, Jesus Christ. Oh, they didn't fucking, they didn't, uh, they didn't cushion the blow with the language there. Uh, Heiselton demonstrated how support for euthanasia could be nurtured by a cultural climate punctuated by science, naturalism, and humanitarian reform. But I can also see why many, you know, people would have a problem with uh, what he did. It's one thing to euthanize a person with a terminal illness who may have had a chance to live life on their own terms, but you know, baby, uh, that's not as clear, right? Who should get to decide whose life is worth living? Uh, after subsiding again in the 1920s, the debate about so-called mercy killing caught fire again in the 1930s, making these years a pivotal juncture in the history of euthanasia in America. When the coming of the Depression and more troubled uh, economic times are with it, 
Americans began talking about suicide and controlled dying. Public opinion polls indicated in 1937 that fully 45% of Americans had caught up with Harry Heiselden's belief that the mercy killing of, quote, infants born permanently deformed or mentally handicapped should be permissible. Again, again, I know that's not in line with today's uh, ethics. 1935, the Voluntary uh, Euthanasia Legislation Society was founded in England by C. Killick Millard, retired public health physician. But then the very next year, a bill to legalize euthanasia was defeated in the British House of Lords. A similar organization, the Euthanasia Society of America, founded in the U.S. in 1938. And then World War II would come along and a tiny mustachioed maniac would put quite a stain on the concept of euthanasia. As Hitler's war machine marched eastward across Europe, news of Nazi atrocities against mental patients and handicapped children filtered back to America, and Americans now associating all human euthanasia with the evils of the Holocaust quickly turned their backs on euthanasia of any kind. 1950, the World Medical Association votes to recommend to all national medical associations that euthanasia be condemned under any circumstances. That same year, the American Medical Association issued a statement that the majority of doctors do not believe in euthanasia. But then just two years later, 1952, the British and American Euthanasia Societies submit a petition to the United Nations Commission on Human Rights to amend the UN Declaration of Human Rights to include, quote, the right of incurable sufferers to euthanasia or merciful death. Inasmuch uh, as this right is then not only uh, consonant with the rights and freedom set forth in the Declaration of Human Rights, but essential to their realization, we hereby petition the United Nations to proclaim the right of incurable sufferers to euthanasia. This back and forth, pro and con, will continue for a while until the 1970s, when though many are still opposed to euthanasia, patient autonomy as a concept now starts to gain more traction. Patient autonomy especially emphasizes the right to refuse medical care, even life-sustaining care. And by 1977, eight states, California, New Mexico, Arkansas, Nevada, Idaho, Oregon, North Carolina, and Texas had signed various right-to-die bills into law. Some are no longer on the books, fucking Idaho, uh, but they were for a while. Uh, Why so much back and forth on this issue? So much controversy. On a very basic level, physician-assisted suicide goes against the Hippocratic Oath. The vow doctors take to do no harm to their patients and try to heal them. But what if the more humane thing is not to make someone live out the life they don't want to live? What if that would be doing them harm? People who advocate for euthanasia say that the right to die should be a matter of personal choice. It's not about whether or not you morally condone it. It's about not enforcing your morality on others in this area in a legal sense. We are able to choose all kinds of different things in life, from who we marry to what kind of work we do. And I think uh, when one, uh, when it comes to the end of one's life, whether you have a terminal illness or whether you're you know, just uh, in pain for other reasons, you should have a legal choice about what happens to you. Very similar to the pro-choice argument concerning abortion to me. Not about condoning abortion. It's about not enforcing your morality on the body of a stranger. It's about freedom. Very disappointed in uh, a bill that just recently passed in Idaho that mirrors the one in Texas. Fucking hate it so much. Couldn't hate it more. Couldn't be more pro-choice. Uh, the pro-euthanasia crowd also say that when healing is no longer possible, when death is imminent and patients find their suffering unbearable, then the physician's role should shift from healing to relieving suffering in accordance with the patient's wishes. There are many diagnoses uh, that lead to unbearable suffering. Everything from advanced cancer to dementia to Parkinson's to lung disease to ALS we talked about earlier. Maybe everyone shouldn't feel pressure to soldier on, no matter what, like Steve Gleason. With certain diseases like advanced forms of cancer, you have a ticking clock hanging above you. You just wait until you can no longer lead the life you live. Others like ALS don't necessarily include death immediately, but they do take away life as you know it. You're trapped in your body, unable to perform the basic tasks that signify your human autonomy, like dressing or feeding yourself. In those cases, advocates of euthanasia say you should have a right to die, to live and end your life on your terms if you don't want to spend your final moments as a shadow of your former self in some ways, and that a doctor should be able to help you do this because it would be humane. They point to countries who have instituted physician-assisted suicide, like the Netherlands, Been doing it since the 1980s. The Rotterdam Court in 1981 established the guidelines for when euthanasia can take place, including that the patient must be experiencing unbearable pain. They must consent. There must be no other reasonable solution to the problem and that the patient must have been given alternatives to euthanasia and time to consider these alternatives among others. Since 1981, these guidelines have been interpreted by the Dutch courts and Royal Dutch Medical Association in ever-broadening terms. One example is the interpretation of the unbearable pain requirement reflected in the Hague Court of Appeals 1986 decision. The court ruled that uh, that the pain guideline was not limited to physical pain and that psychic suffering or the potential disfigurement of personality could also be grounds for euthanasia. 
That's a very interesting phrasing. Uh, disfigurement of personality. I actually really like that. Uh, all this makes me think about former suck subject Robin Williams, right? Completing suicide after privately struggling with uh, Louis body dementia, erasing his personality. He wanted to end it before he was no longer Robin in any real way. And uh, I can't blame him. Today, euthanasia in the Netherlands is regulated by the Termination of Life on Request and Assisted Suicide Act. Passed in 2001, took effect in 2002. Official data showed that the number of euthanasia cases has risen more or less continuously since 2006, reaching 6,361 in 2019. These cases, though, they make up just a very small proportion of all deaths. Uh, But they have doubled from just under 2% in 2002 to just over 4% in 2019. But again, keep in mind, you know, that 4%, many of those people were near death uh, already. Higher rates of euthanasia uh, also associated with higher household income, good self-reported mental and physical health. This isn't, uh, you know, mentally ill people making these uh, decisions, um, oftentimes possibly because the well-off and the healthy may be more inclined to ask for assistance in dying when they do suffer, suggests the researchers. Clearly, while the numbers there are rising, they don't point to legalizing euthanasia as leading to people just offing themselves left and right, all fucking willy-nilly. Still, many in America don't think that uh, that is a good enough reason to legalize it here. Opponents of euthanasia say that euthanizing patients with terminal illnesses would make other people with terminal illnesses feel like they, quote, deserve to die. I strongly disagree. Why does what is right for one have to be right for all? Why make it so personal? People do this so much, right? I've told dark stand-up bits on stage for years and countless times. I'll watch someone having a good time in the crowd. All fun and jokes. But then one of the jokes happens to hit on something near and dear to their heart. And oh, now it's no longer a comedy show. Now now it's personal. Uh, If you're listening and you're suffering from ALS, for example, to be clear, I'm not pressuring you to die. Uh, I just think that because of the severity of the the condition, if you want to die before the disease uh, takes away more of your abilities, you should just be allowed to end the pain if you want. That's all. Very much in favor of personal choice. Not everyone's wired with the ability to withstand it and continue to find uh, enough meaning to make life worthwhile. Uh, Opponents also think that seeing suicide as a solution for some illnesses will only undermine the willingness of doctors and society to learn how to show real compassion and address patients' pain and other problems. They say that in states that have legalized assisted suicide, uh, you know, in fact, uh, uh, most patients request the lethal drugs not due to pain or even fear of future pain, but due to concerns like loss of dignity and becoming a burden on others, attitudes that these laws encourage. And I say, so fucking what? Aren't those concerns representative of a different kind of pain? Rather than suicide, these opponents want to care for people in ways that assure them that they have the dignity They desire, and it is a privilege, not a burden, to care for them as long as they live. But what if they don't agree? Uh, They also point to the idea that a physician-assisted suicide were legal. Insurers would encourage suicide now as a way to save money. Well, that's an entirely separate argument. Allowing a patient to choose to die is one thing. Allowing an insurance company to refuse coverage to someone who won't die, (laughs) that's very different. A lot of different laws would need to be passed. You know, it's a very different argument. I don't think legalizing euthanasia opens up a slippery slope, uh, you know, uh, argument, concern, probably instilled in our culture about this topic as a result of past eugenics movements with the Nazis uh, and that physician-assisted suicide is just a hop, skip, and a jump away from, uh, you know, uh, people being mandated to be killed. Uh, Whether that's true or not, these opponents do point out that the Dutch have a system, uh, you know, though that they have one, it's not as cut and dry as you might think. Many Dutch euthanasia cases involve the end-of-life clinic and network of facilities, affiliated with the largest Dutch euthanasia advocacy organizations. Uh, These clinics routinely handle euthanasia requests refused by other doctors. And many doctors seem to refuse requests made by those suffering from psychiatric disorders, not physical ailments. Psychiatric diagnosis, not based on an objective laboratory or imaging test, generally more subjective assessment based on standard criteria agreed on by professionals in that field. Some doctors reach conclusions with which other doctors may reasonably disagree. Right. For example, an otherwise healthy Dutch woman is, uh, was euthanized 12 months after her husband's death for prolonged grief disorder, a diagnosis listed in the International Classification of Diseases, but not in the DSM, in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders used by psychiatrists and psychologists around the world. So I get uh, that there's um, a, a problem with all this. You know, it gets a little loose. It can get looser with um, psychiatric illnesses. Dr. K would never euthanize anyone with a psychiatric disorder, uh, according to him. Uh, But this example goes to show how murky all can be. Whatever your opinion on this may be, you you certainly can't expect all physicians to, uh, you know, be down with helping someone take their life. That might just go against an individual's ethics, which I get. Uh, The American Medical Association's present day guidelines seem to toe the line between these two ways of thinking. According to them, this is what a physician should do when it comes to assisted suicide. They should thoughtfully consider whether or and how significantly an action 
or declining to act will undermine the physician's personal integrity, right? Create emotional or moral distress for the physician. Compromise their ability to provide care for uh, other patients. Also, before entering into a patient-physician relationship, make clear any specific interventions or services the physician cannot in good conscience provide because they are contrary to the physician's deeply held personal beliefs. Makes sense. Uh, Three, take care that their actions do not discriminate against or unduly burden individual patients or populations of patients and do not adversely affect patient or public trust. Fair. Four, be mindful of the burden their actions may place on fellow professionals. Okay. Five, uphold standards of informed consent and inform the patient about all relevant options for treatment, right? Including options to which the physician morally objects. Uh, six, in general, physicians should refuse a patient to a, a refer a patient, excuse me, to another physician or institution to provide treatment the physician declines to offer. Yes. Seven, continue to provide uh, other ongoing care for the patient or formally terminate the patient-physician relationship in keeping with ethics guidance. So oh, fair, you know, you got to protect doctors and patients, both. Uh, these days, physician-assisted suicide, legal in 10 states, and in uh, D.C. It's an option given to individuals by law in Colorado, uh, like I said, D.C., Hawaii, Maine, New Jersey, New Mexico, Oregon, Vermont, and Washington. Not okay in Idaho anymore. Of course not. So socially conservative here. Fuck me. Drives me crazy. We'll probably be the last state to legalize weed. Le- legalize the devil's lettuce. Good job, Boise lawmakers, you fucking pieces of shit. Anyway, physician-assisted suicide is an option given to individuals in Montana and California via court decision. Individuals uh, must have a terminal illness as well as a prognosis of six months or less to live. The specific method in each state varies, but mainly involves a prescription from a licensed physician approved by the state in which the patient is a resident. Physician-assisted suicide differs from euthanasia, which is defined as the act of assisting people with their death in order to end their suffering, but without the backing of a controlled legal authority. In states where it's legal, physician-assisted suicide, uh, not incredibly common. According to California's 2018 Department of Public Health annual report, 452 individuals received prescriptions. 337 people died after ingestion of dispensed medication between January 1st, December 31st, 2018. For a state with tens of millions of people, that's not a, that's not a lot. Uh, this was made legal from a 2015 law signed by Governor Jerry Brown. Uh, yes. But Colorado's Department of Public Health and Environment uh, reported that in 2020, uh, 188 prescriptions for aid and dying medication were written by physicians for patients. And in 145 of those, the medication was dispensed by a pharmacy. Again, that's not a huge number. Oregon's a state many of us seem to associate with physician-assisted suicide. And that's, uh, they allowed, uh, they've allowed physician-assisted suicide legally there since 1997 with their historic Death with Dignity Act. In Oregon, as of January 22, 2021, prescriptions have been written for a grand total of under 3,000 people, 2,895. And less than 2,000 people actually uh, have taken the prescription, used it, ingested the drugs that were legally prescribed to them under the law, uh, 1,905. So less than 2,000 in over 23 years. And that includes the deaths of, you know, many terminally ill people uh, who moved there specifically so they could die in a physician-assisted way. An important number to keep in mind because some moralists have argued, as I know I've already mentioned, that if you legalize this nationwide, oh my gosh, people are going to be checking out left and right. It's going to be an epidemic of death. But the stats do not back up that moral argument. The stats often don't back up so many people's arguments. Uh, Oregon's Death with Dignity Act would probably not have been passed had it not have been for the national debate stirred up by Dr. Kevorkian, the man who, whether or not you agree with his methods or even physician-assisted suicide in general, you know, brought it to the public consciousness in a big way. Let's now look at his fascinating life and times in today's Time Suck timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. On May 26, 1928, the man who became Dr. Kevorkian is born in Pontiac, Michigan, just outside Detroit. Murad Jacob Reaper Kevorkian. I may have added the Reaper. Uh, his parents were Armenian immigrants from present day Turkey. His father, uh, Levon, uh, so sorry, I think I said Armenia earlier. Arme- Armenian but from an Armenian community in Turkey. Uh, his father, Levon, uh, Levon, was born in 1887 in the village of Pasin, and his mother, uh, Satanig, born in 1900, was born in the village of Godvin. As you might remember from our episode on the Armenian genocide, the turn of the century, uh, really not a good time to be an Armenian in Turkey or near Turkey. Uh, luckily, uh, Levon got the fuck out. He made his way to Pontiac in 1912, where he found work at an automobile factory, made sure to send money back to his family in Armenia. He enrolled at a night school to improve his English, learn mathematics. Uh, Levon would even uh, build the house where Dr. K was born. Uh, sadly, three years after moving to Michigan, his family stopped writing back. 
I bet you can guess why. The horrifying genocide where roughly uh, one and a half million largely Christian Armenians murdered by predominantly Muslim young Turks and the Ottoman Empire. Jack's grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins had been murdered. His family tree uh, savagely pruned. Jack's mother, Santanig, left in 1915 at just 15 years old before uh, finding refuge with relatives in Paris before eventually reuniting with her brother in Pontiac. Many of her family members you know, died as well. Uh, Levon and Santanig met through the Armenian community in their new city where they married, began their family. The couple had a daughter, Margaret, in 1926, followed by son, Murad, Jacob, Dr. K, and then their third and last child was Flora. And Satanik's tales of the genocide would uh, be a big influence on young Jack Kevorkian. Pontiac, where Kevorkian was raised, had become an important wagon and carriage manufacturing city in the 1880s. And then it turned to automobiles, auto parts, buses, trucks as the main source of industry. As of the 2020 census, the city had a total population of 61,606 back in Dr. K's day. Uh, it was experiencing a boom from 34,273 people in 1920 to 64,928 in 1930. Damn, that really was a boom. Uh, this was because throughout the 1920s and 30s, Pontiac had a tremendous growth in its population and, uh, and size as tens of thousands of prospective auto workers moved there from the South to work on its GM auto assembly plants at Pontiac Assembly. African-Americans came in the Great Migration, seeking work, education, the chance to vote, escape the oppression of Jim Crow in the South. In the early 1930s, Levon lost his job at the automobile foundry, but found work then as a contractor and in time became a successful sewer and water main contractor making a lucrative living as the owner of his own excavating company. So getting laid off from making cars, best thing that ever happened to him. Second best thing, after fleeing Armenia or fleeing Turkey uh, before being murdered. As children, the three Kevorkian siblings were encouraged to perform well in school and all demonstrated high academic performance. Three smarties. A precocious child, Jack loved to play war games, doing paper mache helmets, wielding potato mashers as hand grenades. An empty lot across from the local hospital became his uh, uh, Bila Woods, uh, Vimy Ridge, Verdun, Battlefields of the Great War. I'm guessing he fantasized a lot about killing Turks as well. Uh, Levon and Santanig raised Jack and his two sisters to have everything that they had lost. And in their nightly stories, you know, they kept the old ghosts alive. When not in the trenches or on the death march, Jack memorized baseball stats. Hell yeah, same. Also drew cartoons, me too. Uh, also invented limericks and taught himself German and Japanese. M me not. Nope, I stopped doodling and memorizing ERAs and home run totals. So he was smarter than me growing up. So what? <clears throat> Excuse me. He stripped uh, wood from abandoned houses to build bonfires where he roasted potatoes until hot. Black peels of charcoal flaked off of them. I also did not do that. Uh, that was a taste that would never leave him. Uh, in later years, when uh, Kevorkian had no fixed address, friends who put him up would notice that he would often use their fireplaces to make himself dinner, which is fucking weird. What a funny quirk. <laughs> I've never known anyone to cook in a fireplace. I love the thought of having him over as a, as a house guest. You know, nah, never seen that fireplace cooking before. And then, you know, you get up for breakfast and he's got like a, a skinned rabbit on a spit in your fireplace. Morning! Rabbit's almost cooked. Potatoes are almost done. You're just in time for breakfast. Uh, Jack was able to enter Eastern Junior High School where uh, when he was in the sixth grade. And by the time he was in high school, he had taught himself German and Japanese in preparation for military service. Uh, but then World War II ended before he came of military age. So that's pretty cool. You know, dude was prepping to fight tyranny. Learning the languages of the enemy. That's intense. Uh, thanks to that intensity, he didn't have a, a lot of close friends growing up while other kids were figuring out dating or messing around with go-karts, going to some sock hops, whatever. He was studying German, Japanese, intensely pursuing other academic interests. His interest in language specifically, the origin and complexities of words would continue for the remainder of his life. The young Jack Kevorkian was described by his peers as an able student, interested in art and music as well. Basically, he was highly intelligent, motivated young dude, uh, graduated with honors from Pontiac High School in 1945 at the age of 17. Kevorkian then attended the University of Michigan School of Engineering between 1946 and 1948. Originally planned to be a civil engineer. But in the middle of his freshman year, he was like, nope, I'm uh, going to focus on botany and biology instead. Started taking classes in chemistry, mathematics, uh, engineering, drawing, rhetoric, history, psychology, uh, also German and Japanese. Uh, by the middle of his uh, you know, freshman year, he had already set his sights on medical school. Going forward, he would take 20 credit hours instead of the normal 16 a semester. That's a big course load to meet the 90-hour medical school requirement as quickly as possible. Then as a med student, he didn't just uh, uh, learn with the goal of uh, repeating what he'd been taught. He began experimenting. He began taking measurements of pupils of cadavers on the theory that his findings would change the uh, imprecise science of estimating the time of death. 
uh, this, uh, these experiments would be ignored at this time, but then he returned these exper- experiments later and it would be useful. I think this shows Dr. K was interested in uh, not just accepting the status quo, he wanted to make advancements. Dr. K graduated with a degree in clinical pathology, 1952, completed his internship at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit by the end of 1953. And there was a moment early in his internship that left him seriously questioning the way doctors dealt with the agony of the dying. As he would later describe it, I was making rounds one night and there was this woman who was dying of liver cancer. It was horrible. Her belly was swollen up so much her skin was almost transparent. You could see the veins. She was in horrible, intractable pain. Looked like she was pleading for death with her eyes, but we couldn't give her that. We had to keep her going, prolonging the agony. It was cruel and barbaric. Excuse me. He then began to read literature of classical antiquity, pertaining to how doctors in Athens and Rome thought it was their duty to relieve the suffering of the terminally ill uh, when a disease had run its course by helping them expire peacefully. He first realized that while suicide was regarded as more or less sinful in all major Western religions, a violation of the God-given sanctity of life decree, it was often accepted by the classical civilization that shaped Western culture. To Kevorkian, that was a big sign that ethics were in part a matter of time and place, right? And the ethical opinion could be reframed as something cruel, like the woman with liver cancer. I find this fascinating as well, always have, how subjective so much of our ethics are, right? Ethical subjectivism. One culture, for example, as you know, execute citizens for acts of homosexuality and adultery. Another passes zero legal judgment on either act. Selling a certain drug could send you to prison for life in one nation. In another, totally legal. Prostitution a crime in one country, seen as normal as another. The act, uh, the age of consent varied pretty wildly over time and throughout different nations. One time and place, a 30-year-old marrying a 15-year-old, right? Get in fucking prison, pedo. In another, congrats to the newlyweds. Shooting an unarmed burglar, murder in some countries, justice in others. Assisted suicide, wrong and illegal or legal and decent. All depends on uh, the time and place it happens. Uh, From 1953 to 1955, Kevorkian served for 15 months as first lieutenant general medical officer in preventative medicine in Korea. Uh, While in Korea, over there, the U.S.-Korean War, uh, he finally got to put his Japanese language skills to use working in medical intelligence. While not attending to injured combatants or trying to get information out of captured Japanese officers or soldiers, Kevorkian would pass the time practicing Bach on his flute teach himself Latin and Greek. He was a very eccentric guy. This guy was a fucking nerd. And I mean that in a, in a good way. Love it. But, uh, God, this, no wonder he didn't ever had that many friends. Uh, I wonder when I started going through the research uh, this week, why he never married, you know, barely dated. Uh, starting to make sense. Hey, 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 Jack, we're heading out to some clubs. Liquor and ladies. Woo, you in, buddy? Uh, sorry, I simply must respectfully decline your warm invitation. Please pass my deepest apologies to the fellas. I'm behind on my self-imposed classical language studies, you see, and I also simply must finish memorizing Toccata and Fugue in D minor. (laughs) The incompleteness of my present ambition currently haunts me. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, okay, Jack. Yeah, I'll I'll tell. Uh, Upon his return to the U.S., Kevorkian entered a medical residency in pathologic anatomy at the University of Michigan Hospital. While serving his residency, Kevorkian became fascinated by death and the act of dying. He would, not like a crazy creep at all, sit for hours staring into the eyes of the dead. Okay. Uh, when an electrocardiogram in the hospital uh, ward signaled that a patient's heart was about to stop before he would tape open his or her eyes and snap photographs, it is written. Still with the fucking eyeballs, this guy. Uh, hoping that they were unconscious while he did that. Guessing they had to have been, right? Doubt the hospital or family members would uh, have stood for Jack doing that if the patients were aware he was doing that. Some poor bastard just, dude, my fucking quit it. Stop touching my fucking eyelids. I'm dying, you dick. Uh, Kevorkian captured the retina's color over time as it shifted through a pale orange, red, then yellow, then finally gray. And his findings, invaluable for medical examiners looking to determine time of death after the fact, uh, were published in a scholarly article in the American Journal of Pathology. It was back at this time, long before it became the face of assisted suicide, that Kevorkian's colleagues took to calling him Dr. Death. Uh, Dr. Death's research soon took him deep into the University of Michigan's library where he was thrilled to discover that 13th century Armenian physicians had performed medical experiments on criminals condemned to execution. For Kevorkian, vivisection, dissecting something while still alive, not a breach of medical ethics. Wow. Flashbacks now of the uh, Unit 731 episode and World War II era Jap- uh, Japan's heinous medical experimentation. Right? They, uh, they tried some vivisections, as did the uh, Nazi doctors. Uh, the way Jack saw the re- revelatory investigation of those condemned bodies 
further the development of medicines that would save lives in the future. And that made the torture all worth it. He was definitely a greater good guy. Uh, he felt that convicts had contributed enormously to the store of human knowledge and their deaths had therefore not been meaningless. And he's right, but you can see uh, probably how this uh, use of this kind of greater good argument to justify a lot of things that are helpful for society overall uh, are also pretty evil for the people being sacrificed. Right? It makes me think about like a climate change, right? The destruction of the Amazon. Centuries of environmental damage thanks to industrial pollutants, uh, the collective carbon emissions of billions of us meat sacks and all of our uh, vehicles and factories. You know, eventually, unless we change the course we're on, I mean, we will make the planet unlivable at some point. That is what all the best scientists are saying. Uh, what is the best, most direct way to avoid that? Well, I would argue it's uh, to kill billions of people. Right? If we kept the smartest people, the tech and industrial innovators also kept enough workers to keep manufacturing going for those who remained, but got rid of, say, I don't know, seven or so billion other people uh, not needed to maintain the quality of life for the roughly one billion remaining people and maybe then impose a family limit of no more than three kids for any couple. You know, the world would quickly be much cleaner. So much food for everyone who remained, uh, just enough tech and industry, especially once, you know, we get robots going to do everything from repair and fly planes to uh, plant and harvest food. It would be overall maybe the closest humanity has ever had to a utopia. But, you know, seven billion innocent people have to fucking be murdered in cold blood for that. Uh, doing what would be best for the planet overall, perhaps the best thing for humanity's future, would require an event that would make, comparatively, in terms of total lives lost, the Holocaust pale in comparison to the evilness of this event. So, you know, uh, the greater good argument, ah, it's, a, it's a tricky one. Uh, 1956, still focused on death, Kevorkian began writing on the death penalty and the participation of prisoners in clinical research. Inspired by research that described medical experiments the ancient Greeks conducted on Egyptian criminals, Kevorkian formulated the idea that similar modern experiments could not only save valuable research dollars, but also provide a glimpse into the anatomy of the criminal mind. Oh, boy. Kevorkian insisted that he was personally opposed to the death penalty. But if the state was going to be in the business of taking human lives, costing taxpayers millions of dollars every year, those deaths ought to be in the service of life. Instead of the electric chair, the gas chamber, or the firing squad, he proposed that a convict would be put under, then while unconscious, can't feel any of this, their body, particularly their brain, would be, you know, experimented on. And then their uh, organs would be carefully harvested for transplant surgeries. Finally, you know, death would come via a, a lethal dose of anesthesia. Kevorkian even visited the Ohio Penitentiary to canvas a group of prisoners to get their thoughts <laughs> on this exact proposal. Dude had balls. How do you feel about me fucking, you know, cutting you, cutting you up, uh, experimenting on you when you're still alive? Uh, both, most inmates were appalled, but a few saw in his idea the possibility of atoning for the unforgivable mistakes they had made right? Some atonement here. As the first man he interviewed later articulated in a letter, it would help me think that I didn't succeed in making a total mess of my life, that I may have helped someone somewhere sometime. And I got to say, uh, I actually like this idea. Hear, hear me out, right? I mean, if the prisoner being killed doesn't feel any more pain than they would being given, say, a lethal injection, why not experiment? I mean, seriously, a valuable medical insight could be gained. I know it seems cringy, like something out of a fucking Saw movie, some uh, hostile torture porn movie nazi documentary or something but take emotions out of it and logically i think this is great but as you can imagine this idea does not gain serious traction politically the voting public too many of them uh, just too squeamish to support something like this it doesn't seem decent 1958 dr k advocated his view in a paper presented to the american association for the advancement of science now his nickname of dr death really starts to catch on and some minor media attention results in his ejection from the University of Michigan Medical Residency Program. The first of many times, the fellow medical community would be like, yeah, let's put some distance between us and him. From 1959 to 1960, Dr. Kevorkian finishes uh, his residency at Pontiac General Hospital now. While still in Pontiac, Kevorkian hears about Russian experiments, transfusing blood from fresh corpses into living patients performed by a team of Soviet researchers. And he enlists the help of his friend and medical lab tech, Neil Nickel, his friend for life, to simulate these same experiments by... <laughs> Oh boy, N Neil would uh, be his like madcap medical collaborator for years. He was played by John Goodman in the HBO film about Kevorkian, You Don't Know Jack. Uh, Jack played by Al Pacino. Uh, the results of their blood transfusions from the dead experiments, uh, actually really successful. Kevorkian believed the procedure could help save lives on the battlefield. I agree. If blood from a bank was unavailable, doctors could transfuse the blood of a corpse into an injured soldier. Kevorkian's method was to remove the blood from the corpse via the neck within six hours of death, a death that would have to be sudden and unexpected, such as one from combat to avoid post-mortem clotting. 
The dead would be held at a 30-degree angle, drawing the blood through standard equipment. The blood in Kevorkian's experiments thoroughly tested to be a matching type, free of disease, clean for transfusion. When the uh, perfect test subject, a 30-year-old heart attack victim, turned up at the hospital, good old Neil volunteered to be Kevorkian's guinea pig. He laid down on the floor next to the deceased while Kevorkian connected a syringe, God, this is so wild, a syringe pump and a tube from the dead man's jugular vein directly into Neil's arm. After receiving uh, 400 cc of blood, Neil felt fine. The next attempt went uh, slightly awry, however. Female volunteer who received a transfusion directly from the heart of a mangled 14-year-old hit-and-run victim became dizzy and nauseous. Turned out the volunteer had effectively ingested a Jaeger bomb. Teacher been out, uh, teenager had been out drinking. Other transfusions hit and miss. Uh, one transfusion donor was a 51-year-old male, died suddenly while mowing his lawn. The recipient, an 82-year-old woman, received three pints of blood over three days and then dying after the third day. But she had other health problems. Her death may have had more to do with underlying conditions uh, than getting a blood transfusion from a corpse. Maybe had more to, uh, to do with being 82. Another donor died in a car accident, 44-year-old white male. The recipient, a 78-year-old white male with heart disease, intestinal cancer, congestive heart failure. He received two pints of donor blood, died nine days after being admitted, but again, serious underlying conditions. Third corpse donor, 46-year-old white male, dead on arrival at the hospital. Recipient, 56-year-old female intestinal cancer patient with severe anemia. She's discharged from the hospital three days after receiving a pint of corpse blood. And she was fucking fine. Uh, Kevorkian noted the presence of uh, increased sugar, potassium, and non-protein nitrogen in cadaver blood. Less than optimal, but not a rate major roadblock to transfusions. Also noted that corpse blood usually washed down the drain anyway, right? It's being wasted, so why not, why not use it for the living? What's this big deal? We use corpse blood for life. Uh, he wrote, most of these objections are more imaginary than real. A sort of emotional reaction to a new and slightly distasteful idea. Our eight pints and over 27,000 transfusions in Russia bear this out. Not a single hint of a reaction or other ill effect was observed by us personally uh, on very close clinical observation, despite the fact that two of the patients were already morbid and very toxic and none of the four had any anti-allergic therapy. His research and experiments found cadaver blood perfectly suitable for donation to living patients, so long as it was drawn less than six hours after death and used within 21 days. Kevorkian pitched this idea to the Pentagon, figuring it could be used in Vietnam, uh, but denied a federal grant to continue the research, right? Just too sad, too weird for people. Instead, the research only confirmed his reputation as an outsider, jolted his colleagues. How frustrating for him. Again, great idea. I, I see no logical objections to this, only emotional ones. When you're dead, it's pretty simple. Uh, you don't need your fucking blood anymore. But the living do. But the thought of someone taking the blood from a loved one who has just passed, you know, it just feels sad. Feels like desecration to many, I'm guessing. Uh, I get it emotionally. Uh, adding insult to injury as a result of uh, blood transfusion experimentations, Kevorkian becomes infected with hepatitis C. Uh, further cementing his outsider status and status as just fucking weirdo, Jack and Neil, sometime around 1960, petitioned the hospital for, fu for funding to perform the first in vitro fertilization of a man by implanting a fetus into Neil's belly. <laughs> and they are denied. What the fuck? Were they, were they going to add a womb? inside the belly where was that gonna go uh where was the fetus supposed to grow right uh his fucking colon just gonna slip back there were they gonna try and make some kind of butt baby was the, was the butt baby supposed to do for food eat, eat poop wish i could have found more details about that experiment i'm guessing jack didn't disclose a lot of details because it maybe embarrassed him a bit or something uh, also in 1960 his father levon dies of a heart attack age of 73 jack is close to his dad takes the loss hard buries himself further into his work uh, during the 1960s, Strange, maybe Mad, maybe a genius, maybe both Kevorkian would move all around, holding a bunch of different positions. From December 1960 to July 1961, uh, he is an associate pathologist at St. Joseph Hospital in Ann Arbor. From 1961 to 1966, an associate pathologist at Pontiac General Hospital. As far as I know, he did not ask for permission to make a butt baby from either hospital. Uh, he did conduct more corpse blood transfusions, though. He's also published in articles. 1966 publication is titled Beyond Any Kind of God, and he would write, Dreamless sleep entails absolute nothingness, which we crave and know to be indispensable. It is an experience which affords us the unique opportunity to begin to know the inscrutable essence of absolute non-existence, which rules out any implication of transfer or transformation or transition from this world to any other world or to anywhere, anything or anyone else. There could be no heaven, hell, purgatory, paradise, nirvana, a moksha or reincarnation and no God. Uh, I don't know about this. Not sure that dreamless sleep is the best evidence for a lack of existence of a higher power or a uh, next plane of existence, but okay. 
Uh, his frustration with the religious right becoming more and more clear, I think here, right? He had no use for religion, nor for any arguments based in religion. And a lot of those arguments were used against his work over and over. Uh, this from 1960, or then from 1967 to 1969, he served as the medical director at the Medical Diagnostic Center in Southfield, Michigan, another suburb of Detroit, not far from Pontiac. Also in the mid 60s, his mom is diagnosed with advanced abdominal cancer. Kevorkian watches as doctors simultaneously restrict the amount of morphine she can receive, even as they fight to prolong her life. The pain is enormous. She says her treatment amounted to torture. Uh, clearly, this pushed him further towards advocating for assisted suicide later. She would die on December 20th, 1968. Jack, now overcome with grief for the loss of both parents. He later said in the years following his mother's death, they both would often come to him in night, at night in dreams. As a way of mourning, Kevorkian turned to oil painting, enrolled in adult education classes at night. Ignoring the moldy still life set up for the other students, Jack painted death itself, cadavers, skulls, in surrealist, uh, surrealistic situations oftentimes. And he was actually, I think, very good. You can look up his stuff, create a stuff that would look great on the set of Scared to Death. Uh, he would often listen to Handel's Messiah as he worked. He gets very obsessed with this. Uh, from 1970 to 1976, Kevorkian works as a pathologist at Saratoga General Hospital in Detroit. Still, sadly, zero butt baby experimentation performed here. Old Neil's colon, stomach, remain fetus free. During this period, he uh, publishes more than 30 journal articles and booklets about his philosophy on death. 1976, Dr. K, now 38, moves to California. Why the sudden move? Well, frustrated by the hospital bureaucracy that shunned and restricted his research, Kevorkian quits medicine, uh, breaks up with his first and only ever girlfriend, Jane. Uh, we know almost nothing about her. Uh, packs up his uh, Volkswagen van, drives to Los Angeles, where he puts his life savings into making a film about Handel's Messiah. Composing, he's a weird dude. Composing in 1741, Handel's Messiah was a three-part uh, aratario, ara, uh, ara similar to an opera, the three parts were drawn from three parts of the Bible, Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah's birth, New Testament stories of the birth of Jesus, his death and his resurrection, and verses relating ultimately to Judgment Day, with the final chorus text drawn from the book of Revelation. Inspired by Christ's perseverance in the face of martyrdom, Kevorkian saw his Messiah as his chance at some kind of redemption. Yet lacking any experience, producers or distributors, with a severely limited budget, his in a bridge screen adaptation of the oratorio, Messiah by George Frederick Handel, ended up a fucking disaster. Stock footage, badly reenacted biblical scenes. It was not a well advised project. He for sure had a touch of madness in him. Uh, unfortunately, this reel is now lost. I would love to uh, watch a clip. A description of it says that it shows surrealistic images of elated shepherds juxtaposed with close ups of blinking eyeballs <laughs> and a young boy in crutches. Ah, oh, it's cool. Can't find any evidence he was doing a shit ton of LSD around that time or any other hallucinogens. Uh, he didn't need him, I guess, just to work on really weird projects. Uh, Kevorkian had hoped that audiences overwhelmed by Handel's score wouldn't even notice the terrible quality of the film's visuals. Ah, oh, buddy. Now broke, he starts sleeping out of his van, picks up the odd job as a substitute pathologist. Also writes a book of poems about dieting called Slimericks, because why the fuck not? They advocated a demi-diet of always leaving half the food on your plate. <laughs> he wrote how your masses consumed may be f may be fitly entombed will weigh heavily upon the mortician I, he lived like this for several years this really weird guy in a van sometimes working at a hospital sometimes writing fucking dumb poems about eating uh, goes broke as an atheist trying to produce a film about an 18th century classical composition based on the bible he lived life on his own terms then beginning in the early 80s Kevorkian gets a show on Berkeley Public Access Cable this is great in a program called The Door he played a professional tour guide to the mind, complete with black turtleneck. Floating visions of his head flash across tripping neon patterns amid crashing thunder as the doctor on the green screen promises the viewer a trip into some very hazy realms of human existence. <laughs> One episode uh, ends with Kevorkian discussing multiple universes and asking solemnly, for what forms of existence are we the amoebas? Here's the beginning of an episode on YouTube right now. Uh, it seems like it might be like the pilot episode. It, to me, it feels like a cross between a college lecture and the Twilight Zone. He's sitting on his porch. Welcome. Say, how would you like to take the most mysterious, exciting, adventuresome trip in the world? I'd love it. We're going to do that. Awesome. In this little half hour. Cool, Jack. Now, what we're going to take a trip into is a little different than you think. It's not geographical. How do you know what I think? It's sort of mental. Okay. It's into these very hazy realms of human existence about which nobody knows anything for certain. The world's most brilliant philosopher or scientist, 
They all guess. Okay. Nobody knows. We're going to guess too, but we're going to use reason and common sense. We're not going to use any prejudices, no dogma, no bias. You're going to use your basic intelligence, and okay. we're going to stretch it to the limit, and it's going to be fun. Okay. I'm in. I'm well, in, Jack. Well, the time has come for us to enter the realm of pure human reason. Yes. So come along with me as we travel through the door. Through the door. And the camera zooms in on the door, going out into space. Like I said, he was an interesting guy. Uh, I wish he would have snapped on that thing. You know, why are we here? Why, why are we doing this? Well, uh, because of the, the fucking moralists in Michigan running the goddamn hospital wouldn't let me put one fucking butt baby in Neil. God damn it. Didn't I prove myself? I helped so many patients. All I want, all I want is a little corpse blood and fucking one butt baby for my friend to see what kind of monster we can make. But they won't give me any funding. That would have been fun. Uh, 1984. Prompted by the growing number of executions in the U.S., Kevorkian advocates an idea we already talked about earlier. Given death row inmates a choice to donate their organs, die by anesthesia, rather than poison gas or the electric chair. He's invited to brief members of the California legislator, uh, legislature on a bill that would enable prison, prisoners to have this choice. His actions receive the attention of the media. Now he becomes involved in the growing national debate on dying with dignity. Following a dispute with a chief pathologist, Kevorkian will claim his career was doomed by phys physicians who feared his radical ideas. And that was sort of true. The only venue that would uh, publish his musings was an Israeli journal called Medicine and Law at this time. Fired from his last hospital job, he now, uh, quote, retires to devote his time to painting, music, a new documentary project on Handel's Messiah. He can't let it go. Uh, also continues research for his death row campaign. Now 57, he's living off his savings. Uh, he had quite a bit, even though he'd lost it all you know, earlier with that first Messiah project. He was super frugal. Uh, he lived either in a van or in a small studio apartment, owned very little, Bought his clothes uh, from thrift shops. Only wanted to work on art, music, and death research. <laughs> then, sadly, before Kevorkian uh, left California in 1984, his artwork, musical instruments, compositions, videos, master films, research papers, library, all of his personal belongings stolen from a storage facility. What a fucking terrible day that would be. Uh, Kevorkian would not paint again until 1993 where he, when he'd recreate some of his 18 pieces of stolen art. Uh, what he focused on instead was, now, finally... Bud Babies. 1985, he's finally able to impregnate his buddy Neil Nichols Cole with the fetus. Somehow, Neil is able to bring that baby to term. And in late 1985, that baby would be put up for adoption, and her name would be, you've probably heard of her, Emily Blunt. Yes, that Emily Blunt from the Quiet Place movies. The Devil Wears Prada, so much more. Uh, John Krasinski's wife. She is Dr. Death's and Neil's butt baby. Look it up! Anything is possible when you sell your soul to the Illuminati. No, I'm kidding. Blunt was born in 1983. Uh, no, of course that's nonsense. Uh, I actually quite like uh, Emily Blunt. It's just funny to me that someone so talented and ridiculously attractive could have started off as a butt baby. Kevorkian returned to Michigan in 1985. That's what really happened in 1985. After putting Emily butt baby Blunt up for adoption. No, uh, he did return. And he moved into a small apartment in Royal Oak where he then wrote a comprehensive history of experiments on executed humans, as one does, uh, which was published in the Journal of the National Medical Association. I fucking love how weird this guy was. Uh, hey Jack, you want to come out and have a drink with us, buddy? <laughs> no, uh, no time, fellas. Sorry, I, I I have to finish my comprehensive history of experiments on executed humans. If I if I can't finish this, I will never get my Handel's Messiah project completed. Also, I just realized I'm making fun of him for dedicating his life to researching weird shit when I am the guy who regularly turns down social plans to research people like Doctor Death. <laughs> Hello, pot making fun of kettle. 1986, Jack discovered a way to expand his death row proposal when he learned that doctors in the Netherlands were help helping people die by lethal injection. He decides to go check it out himself. During the summer of 1987, Kevorkian visits the Netherlands, where he studies techniques that allow Dutch physicians to assist in the suicides of the terminally ill without interference from legal authorities. In the Netherlands, he meets Dr. Peter Admiral, a leading anesthesiologist whose underground work would later lead to the full legalization of voluntary euthanasia in the Netherlands in 2000. And Dr. Admiral told Kevorkian straight up, that experimenting on the bodies of convicts was insane. I'm still for it. I mean, do they volunteer? Come on, they're dying anyway. Not because they're convicts, convicts, but anyone should be able to volunteer for that. But, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm insane too. I, I have, uh, you know, uh, heard a lot of feedback in that regard from family and friends uh, and sometimes fans. Dr. Admiral also convinced Dr. Kevorkian that the best way to cheat death was to help people take control of their own endings. 
Dr. Kevorkian doubles down on his death focus, gets to writing more Right to Die articles in 1988. They were almost never published. By 1989, most American medical journals were rejecting Dr. K's increasingly controversial articles. Few people were paying attention to him, so he tries a new approach. He begins writing new articles, this time about self-administered euthanasia, or medicide, as he called physician-assisted suicide. He was inspired by a Detroit-area man named David Rivlin, 38-year-old, paralyzed in 1971, at the age of 19, in a surfing accident that severed his, severed his spine. David had struggled bravely to make an independent wheelchair-bound life for himself until a failed spinal operation now left him further paralyzed, confined now to a nursing home bed, unable to breathe without a respirator tube down his throat, artificially inflating and deflating his lungs. He's completely paralyzed. He was facing 20 or 30 more years of life as how he saw it, a gasping, immobile head on a completely paralyzed, immobile body. And he decided he wanted to die. David knew that he literally couldn't do it himself. He begged his nursing home doctors to help him. They refused, unwilling to risk liability and controversy, which led Rivlin to make a public appeal in a Detroit newspaper for some doctor, any doctor, to come forward, help him carry out his final wish. Kevorkian responded. He decided what Rivlin needed was a way of pulling the plug on himself by himself. Rivlin was still able to manipulate a stick held in his teeth. If Kevorkian could create a device with a hair trigger button that Rivlin could push with this stick, he could give the ex-surfer the ability to end his life with what he considered dignity. This whole business would fall into a legal and ethical gray area, somewhere between what medical ethicists call passive euthanasia and active euthanasia. Passive euthanasia, which was sanctioned in carefully limited circumstances by the American Medical Association's Council on Medical and Judicial Affairs, involves a doctor withdrawing or withholding life-saving or life-sustaining technology from a patient such as respirators that artificially keep uh, you know, lungs going, feeding tubes that prolong a persistent vegetative state in a patient who would die otherwise. Essentially, passive euthanasia is a doctor merely stepping out of the way of a natural course of one's death. But active euthanasia involves a doctor stepping in to cause death, say through lethal injection. And active euthanasia nationwide at that time vehemently condemned by the American Medical Association and most medical ethicists. So Kevorkian created a machine he called the Thanatron, Named after the Marvel supervillain Thanos, Thanos, right? Genocidal warlord from Titan. Uh, I think it's Thanos, who wanted to bring stability to the universe by wiping out half of all life at every level through arranging the Infinity Stones into the Infinity Gauntlet, snapping his fingers. He did do that, but the Avengers, you know, go back in time and, you know, they stop him. Or maybe Kevorkian called his machine Thanatron because that is Greek for instrument of death. Probably that. Uh, he assembled it out of $45 worth of material. Some sources say 30 bucks from the Salvation Army. So from essentially a discarded erector set, some old toys and bits of jewelry, he figures out how to create uh, death with the press of a button. Even if you hate that he did this, I mean, fucking points for creativity and resourcefulness. Uh, three bottles suspended from a rickety beam, one filled with a saline solution to open a patient's veins, another with barbiturates for sedation, a third with potassium chloride to stop the heart. After the doctor connected the patient to an IV, he or she would pull a chain on the device to start the lethal medications flowing. He called it his Rube Goldberg suicide device. That's a solid reference. Uh, Rube Goldberg machine, named after American cartoonist Rube Goldberg, is a chain reaction type machine or contraption intentionally designed to perform a simple task in an indirect and overly complicated way. Uh, Rube worked as a cartoonist from 1907 all the way to 1963, uh, drawing a lot of stuff like that. Kevorkian's Thanatron uh, allowed the patient to administer the dose themselves, handing over the act of suicide to the individual, if only in a nominal way because the doctor would still have to provide the materials to make it work. So was that passive or active? A little bit of both. In one way, the patient, not the doctor, takes the final fatal action of flicking the death switch, making the doctor even more passive than the physician who passively pulls a plug on a respirator, for example. Uh, ultimately, I think this inaction is what makes the doctor passive with a machine like this. Yes, the doctor is providing the gun, but the patient's pulling the trigger, so to speak. On the other hand, critics contend the doctor hooking up a patient to a machine is active in a crucial sense. He brings into the picture the deadly drug. He doesn't merely let death take its course, but gives it a final boost. Essentially, the doctor does not pull the trigger, but does provide the bullet. Uh, not much that different, at least on the surface, than a doctor saying, don't take 20 pills because you'll die, and then leaving a bottle of 20 pills somewhere accessible, giving the patient a hard wink. But again, he or she not forcing the pills down anyone's throat. But admittedly, in my experience, I seem to be a much more strident promoter of the importance of personal responsibility than the average person. Right? I received questionable parental advice, discipline growing up in moments like everyone else. Uh, I've dated some people who are not good for me, actively harmful. I've hung out with friends who are not good influences. But at the end of the day, I claim 100% responsibility for every shitty thing I've ever done. Others may have handed me symbolic guns in moments, but it was always up to me to pull the trigger or not. 
but I think I'm in the minority thinking this way. A lot of people, intelligent people, assign Kevorkian a, a much more active role in these deaths than I do. In an article published in the American Journal of Forensic Psychiatry, Kevorkian outlined guidelines for this assisted suicide. Eligibility limited to those who are mentally sound and unwavering, incurably ill, and unbearably suffering. Using placeholder names like Wanda End It All <laughs> and Will Be Ready. I see what he did there. Uh, but another doctor intervened with a more conventional solution before Kevorkian had a chance to test his invention on David Rivlin. David was taken respirator and all to the house of a friend where a sympathetic doctor sedated him, disconnected him from the respirator, leaving him to die naturally of asphyxiation. By all reports, he died peacefully with dignity. And that doctor never charged with anything. Meanwhile, Dr. K now coming up with ideas about what to do with his new machine. After years of rejection from national medical journals, media outlets, Kevorkian becomes the focus of national attention for his machine and his proposal to set up uh, obitoriums, death clinics, basically, where or orbit, uh, obitator, obitoriums, it's a made up word, uh, where doctors could help the terminally ill and end their lives. Uh, he began to advertise in Detroit area newspapers for uh, an obitorium that would uh, offer death counseling for the terminally ill and their families. When Dr. K's later trials made him famous, late night hosts like D David Letterman would joke about stuff like this in various top 10 lists. Uh, one of them was Letterman's top 10 promotional slogans for Dr. Kevorkian's suicide machine. Number five, Klaus von Bülow says, I liked it so much, I bought the company. Number four, while I'm killing myself, I'm also cleaning my oven. Number eight, isn't it about time you took an honest look at your miserable, sinking life? <laughs> I, I don't usually like uh, or didn't usually like Letterman's top 10 list. Found a lot of them to be pretty corny, but those are pretty good. Uh, gag on Jay Leno would focus on imaginary improvements to the machine, one of them being the addition of a snooze alarm to allow the patient 10 more minutes after he's hit the switch. I think that's pretty funny. Uh, another would allow the Thanatron to be activated by the clapper. Well done, late night staff writers. Uh, a reporter would actually ask him about a snooze button in 1991. Shouldn't there be some way to pause it? And Kevorkian said, absolutely not. This is a job for me. I get paid for this. I'm not loading up all my gear, traveling around the country for some wishy-washy coward to back out at the last seconds. I'm not a crybaby coach. I'm a death Sherpa. I'm the Grin Reaper's right-hand man. If you need a snooze button on an execution machine, you shouldn't be put down for being in pain. You should be put down for being a snively little sissy bitch. Are you a little sissy bitch? Are you? At that point, the reporter tried asking him, like, are you kidding? And he just kept saying over and over, are you a little sissy bitch or not? Are you? And then he was like, eventually two inches from the reporter's face, just kept yelling this. And the guy just shook his head, walked away, as then Kevorkian yelled, I have made butt baby smarter than you. And of course, it never happened. If it did, I'd be playing the video right now so you could at least hear the audio. Now, what Jack said was, no, because we don't take the guard off the switches till we're absolutely sure we're going to go. I talked to them. After a long discussion, and they're absolutely sure, I, I repeat, you sure you don't want to stop? You sure you don't want to change your mind? Let me take the guard off. Then they hit the switch. If they still wanted to go after they hit the switch, I can, I can stop it easily. I can pull the needle out. They can pull the needle out before they fall asleep. Up until the last moment, they have control. Control would be a key word in the value system that underlies Kevorkian's defense of his machine. The ability to control death, otherwise so random and prolonged, was very important to him. Uh, his medical ethos actually went even further to control life after death in a way, for example, by harvesting viable organs to save other people. That's the biggest misunderstanding about me, Kevorkian would say, that I'm obsessed with death. I'm really pro-life. My writings are all about trying to get medical benefits from death, right? For the living. Makes an interesting argument here, right? He fought for the living to decide. He fought for the living to be able to use what the dead no longer needed, like their blood. A groundbreaking article that helps Kevorkian's cause comes out in March of 1989. The physician's responsibility toward hopelessly ill patients, a second look which carried the byline of 12 respected doctors, caused a stir in the medical profession by endorsing consideration of physician-assisted suicide. 10 of the 12 co-authors stated they believed that it is not immoral for a physician to assist in the rational suicide of a terminally ill person. Clearly, the subject of assisted suicide deserves wide and open discussion. Dr. Kevorkian, reading this article, immediately beats off for the first time in a good 15 years. Uh, JK. I feel like I didn't need to say JK, but I just would feel bad if that's what someone remembered most about this suck. The Kevorkian beat off to an article about prestigious doctors considering assisted suicide. Uh, 1990, Dr. Dr. Kevorkian contacted by Janet Adkins, 54-year-old Oregon woman who suffers from Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's, an incurable condition, causes progressive loss of memory, insight, other mental functions. Most Alzheimer's patients don't choose or plan suicide. Doctors who deal with the uh, uh, affliction report like acute mental suffering or doctors who deal with the affliction report little acute mental suffering, at least in the later stages, in part because as the disease progresses, victims lose a sense of what they lost. 
Uh, it's often said this disease in the end, harder on the family of the victim than the victim themselves. They become more and more childlike, uh, but not children who agonize over having once been adults. So why did Janet choose to end her life? According to her husband, Ron, Janet's mental acuity was something she really prided herself on. He described how she had been the light in our lives. She was always coming up with new ideas, always abreast of new philosophical thinkings. And she just enlarged her life because of her interest and curiosity. Uh, she'd found out about her Alzheimer's with, uh, when certain cognitive problems presented themselves. First, when Janet suddenly struggled to sight-read music. Music had been the glue of the Atkins' 30-year marriage. They'd met in college when they were both studying the French horn. Uh, now that their three sons had grown and left the house, they loved to spend their evenings together sight-reading music. Ron would play the flute. Janet would play the piano. It's fucking adorable. Hail, hail, Lucifina. Yes, Lucifina can love sweet and tender moments as well. Uh, while they used to sit for hours and nights sight-reading music, now Janet was stumbling through pieces. Then she started having trouble spelling. Janet and Ron thought at first, maybe just really hoped, that it might have just been Janet's glasses, but a consultation with her doctor gave them bad news. It was Alzheimer's. The future now looked bleak. One day, maybe not in the far future, Ron would have to do everything for Janet, dress her, get her to eat, make sure she didn't wander off, all while she had no idea who he was. While doctors said that Janet may have uh, had three or four good years left with minimal memory impairments, this was all too much to, to bear for Janet. Gradually losing her memory was unbearable for her. And now she was uh, in intense psychological pain nearly 100% of the time, knowing she was losing what had made her, her, and knowing there was no cure. This wasn't depression or anxiety she could possibly medicate. Losing her identity was now inevitable. It was already happening. A horrible ball was rolling downhill. It would only pick up speed as it traveled. She also didn't want to put her husband Ron through so much despair, living life wondering if today was the day that he would wake up and his wife would not recognize him. So Janet decides on suicide. In fact, long before Janet met Dr. K or was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, she'd been a proponent of the right to die with dignity. She held spiritual beliefs about the impermanence of death that aligned well with leaving this realm to explore others. She'd read Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's On Death and Dying, published in 1969, a book that postulates that those experiencing grief go through a series of five emotions, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and then acceptance. She also read the uh, Bhagavad uh, Gita, the Hindu scripture that translates to the song by God. She believed in reincarnation. Life is a stepping stone in the process of existence. Uh, and now more on Kubler-Ross. We mentioned exploring her earlier, this author. Like Kevorkian, she added a lot to the national discussion of death. Also like Kevorkian, she had some crazy ideas. This is actually my favorite part of the episode coming up. Uh, she had ideas crazier maybe in some ways than putting a fetus in your, in your guy friend's body so he could have a butt baby. I really hope... <laughs> Kevorkian's buddy, Neil Nickel, had a uterus, by the way, that Jackson never mentioned. Somehow implanted. I don't know what the fuck was going on there. Anyway, the sidebar on Kubler-Ross, well worth the ride. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who wrote On Death and Dying, was a pioneer in studying the terminally ill. After several near-death experiences in her own childhood, she worked as a lab assistant for refugees in Zurich at only 13 years old during World War II. She comes to America. She begins her psychiatric residency in the Manhattan State Hospital in the early 1960s. Uh, began her career working to create treatment for those who were schizophrenic, along with those who faced the title hopeless patient, a term used at that time to re uh, reference terminally ill patients. These treatment programs worked to restore the patient's sense of dignity and self-respect. Kubler-Ross also intended to reduce the medications that kept these patients overly sedated, found ways to help them relate to the outside world. Uh, Ross was horrified by the neglect and abuse of mental patients, as well as the imminently dying. Uh, she found that patients were often treated with little care or completely ignored. In 1962, she accepted a position at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. There, Kubler-Ross worked as a junior faculty member, gave her first interview of a young, terminally ill woman in front of a room full of medical students. She wanted to depict to her students a human being who desire, whose desire to be understood, uh, excuse me, who desired to be understood as she was coping with her illness and how that impacted her life. She'd say, now you are reacting like human beings instead of scientists. Maybe now you'll not only know how a dying patient feels, but you will also be able to treat them with compassion, the same compassion that you would want for yourself. During the 1970s, Kubler-Ross became the champion of the worldwide hospice movement, the growth of end-of-life care facilities. She traveled over 20 countries, six continents, initiating various hospice and palliative care programs. I mean, she did a lot of great shit. Then in 1977, uh, she and her husband bought 40 acres of land in Escondido, California, near San Diego where she found, founded uh, Shanti Nalaya, Home of Peace, a healing center for the dying and their families. And here her studies take a fucking weird turn. In the late 70s, after interviewing thousands of patients who had died and been resuscitated, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross becomes very interested in out-of-body experiences, mediums, spiritualism, other ways of contacting the dead. 
She starts housing life, death, and transition workshops around the country and abroad, attracting hundreds of people, most of them facing imminent death, their families, and medical professionals who work with the dying. And this led to criticism. First, she began to offer in her workshops for the dying a grain of hope. There is no death, she said, only life after life, a happy existence in which all the physical ailments and mental problems of the body disappear. I believe this probably happens too, but like 90% believe it, right? Uh, I don't think I can ever believe it 100% because, you know, I haven't been dead yet. And I haven't met anyone who's been dead, like dead, dead. Not for a few minutes dead. You know, I'm talking like for a few hours of days. If someone I know comes back as a zombie after at least a couple days of being dead and is like, there's another room. Well, now I'm up to 100% and probably scared. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross couldn't know what she was saying with 100% certainty, but she said it anyway. Uh, Her message was, some critics noted the same kind of hope that many organized religions have offered man for centuries, right? This message added considerably to the popularity of her workshops for the dying, according to her aides. Uh, Second, she raised scientific skepticism with her statements uh, that she had encountered materialized supernatural spirits and had given names to four of these spirits, Mario, Anka, Salem, and Willie. (laughs) Pretty sweet names for ghosts. It's me, Mario, Abua. Abua, aren't you scared? I the shaking in the wee breeches, Mario, terrified of the ghost of Willie. Uh, Kuba Ross said she believed that she had lived in the time of Jesus under the name of Isabel. Cool story, bro. Um, when she got criticism for this, she said that her critics would eventually see her as the prophet she was. Oh, here we go. 1976, uh, this prophet meets Jay Barham former Arkansas sharecropper who worked for 18 years for, this story gets weirder, for a San Diego airplane manufacturer before he formed the Church of the Facet of Divinity in 1975. Kubler-Ross would say uh, that Jay Barnum had healing powers now and the ability to commute with, uh, communicate with spirits. And this would lead to so fucking, one of the, oh my God, this is so weird, quite a scandal. Jane Elizabeth developed a therapy program for a new center now to the tune of 220, 220 bucks for a four-day session. Sessions included screaming, Pounding of rubber hoses on wooden blocks, occasional super therapeutic physical activity of other kinds. Uh, so much wackadoodle happening now. It's getting get so much weirder. Then you could also get an invite to a really uh, peculiar show of Jay's. Barham regularly conducted seances in which he acted as a medium to communicate with what he called afterlife entities. It's me, it's Mario, uh, claiming he could channel the spirits of the departed and summon ethereal entities. Jay encouraged church members not just to talk to entities, but to literally fuck them. It's it's me, a cinematica, it's Mario, get to the Mario, ghost to Dica. Not kidding. He encouraged church members to engage in sexual relations with the spirits, and some did. Many of these sessions, former female members, the group uh, of the group asserted, uh, as they would assert later, they were instructed to enter a side room where they were joined a few minutes later in the dark by an unclothed man who talked convincingly <laughs> of being an afterlife entity. The entity they asserted then proceeded to convince the women that they should engage in sex with him. And most conceded that they did. Then other women would be inspired to fuck Jay, who was pretending to be this ghost. What? Is this rape? I'm not sure what the fuck this is. It's got, it should be a crime of some sort, right? If you consent to fuck a ghost, and then the ghost is like, you know, uh, boo, you just got trick dicked. I'm a real guy. Aren't you a victim of some kind of sexual assault? I think yes, because that's not what you signed up for. This is so fucking weird, it makes my head hurt. Former members said that several male members in the group now start to complain that no female entities are participating in them, right? Of course they do. No fair! How come you get all the ghost dick, but we get like no ghost puss? Boo! And not the ghost kind of boo either. Bring out the ghost puss! Barham now asks female members if they wouldn't mind playing the role of fuck spirits. And some of them agree. (laughs) So now these guys are being uh, trick raped, I guess. Every time I think I've fucking heard it all, we come across something like this. Uh, eventually there are rumors, of course, that Barham is tricking members of the church of the fast of divinity to, to fuck him because he is That's exactly what he's doing. Kubler Ross's friend, Deanna Edwards, uh, was invited to attend a service to ascertain whether these allegations are true or not. She finds, <laughs> she finds Barham naked and wearing only a turban. Uh, when she, uh, uh, unexpectedly, uh, pulls masking tape off a light switch and <laughs> flicks on the light. Jesus Christ. He's covering a light switch with masking tape. And then just walking around with a turban and a boner in the dark. Boo! Oh, boo! Get on my ghost stick! And this works. Uh, man, the world has never had a shortage of con artists or fools for them to con. In an interview after the scandal, Mr. Barham says that he knew that several women had alleged that he had posed as an afterlife figure, but he insisted he had never engaged in sex with any of them. Come on! 
He was just walking around naked with a heart on, minding his own business, and Ismario is doing the, the fucking. Uh, no one has ever come up to me and said, hey, I had sex with an entity, he said, but added, the, it wouldn't surprise him if they had. I have no firsthand knowledge of it, he continued, but I will say, I will say this. The entities have, you know, said with us that, yeah, it's possible if they can clone a physical body in its totality, then it is totally functional and they are capable of being intimate or having intercourse. And they also told us that if there was a value in it to that person and it would be a positive experience psychologically, physically, emotionally, spiritually, then yeah, they would not hesitate. (sighs) I love these fucking phrase saying shit like this to investigators. Despite uh, being caught almost red dicked. After this accusation of sexual misconduct, Kubler Ross protects him for another year, saying the allegations are made by vengeful detractors, right? Defectors. Uh, then she announces, though, the ending of her association with Jay uh, Barnum in her Shanti Nalaya newsletter, June 7th, 1981. What the fuck is happening here? Luckily, not long after this, she changes her focus away from Ghost Dick to working for AIDS patients in, ad- in an advocacy role and regains some of her earlier champion of good causes credibility. Not all. <laughs> once, once you go Ghost Dick Clinic, he can't be taken totally seriously ever again. And then she lives until 2004. I told you that little sidebar was worth it. Jesus Christ. How could I not dip into some ghost dick? Back to the main story now. Uh, the work of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross had a big impact on Alzheimer's victim, Janet Adkins. Like Kubler-Ross, she'd gotten interested in spiritualism, not quite to the ghost dick level, but quite a bit. Uh, she'd even gone to a medium, come to believe she'd once believe, uh, lived in Greece before, where she had nine kids. Both Janet and Ron had been longtime members of the Hemlock Society, as well, the group that teaches the virtues and techniques of self-deliverance from prolonged suffering. In fact, she had planned the date of her death before consulting Dr. Kevorkian, planned it for November 30th, 1989, didn't want to spoil Christmas for uh, Ron and the kids. Then she read an article about a doctor in Michigan named Kevorkian who'd caused some controversy when a local medical society journal refused to take out an ad he tried to place for a suicide device. Uh, Then they saw him on Donahue, on the Donahue show, uh, demonstrating this device. Janet realized it used the same anesthetic, then legal drug method the Dutch used, something she'd explored before finding out that some legal restrictions uh, made ending her life in Holland impossible for her. So she and her husband get in touch with Kevorkian. And it was not exactly boom, 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 let's get it done. In fact, when the Atkinses first got in touch with the doctor, he uh, discouraged them, telling them to try an experimental drug treatment for Alzheimer's. She waited six months before contacting Dr. K again. April 1990, finds out the experimental drug uh, didn't have any effect on her. Now Kevorkian agrees to meet with her. In the meantime, Janet planned her memorial service, arranged for a family therapist to meet with her three sons. Oh, that's so sweet. Said goodbye to her friends and mother. Then Janet and Ron travel to Detroit to meet with him. Uh, June 4th, 1990, Kevorkian assists Janet in ending her life on a bed inside his 1968 Volkswagen van parked in a campground near his home in Michigan. He would say to a Vanity Fair reporter writing in 91 that he didn't want Janet to be uh, the first to die on his suicide machine. He had thought that the ideal test case would be a terminally ill cancer patient, that Janet's mental anguish as opposed to physical anguish made it so that she wasn't the right person to demonstrate his machine to the world. Uh, That was why he'd encourage her to go through with experimental treatment. And he hadn't wanted their meeting to take place the way it did, where it did. He knew it would look bad, even creepy. Vans do not have the best association when it comes to merciful, dignified deaths. Uh, But Kevorkian would say that they were turned away by other establishments, any other uh, establishment they could find, motels, private homes, funeral parlors. He even looked into renting an EMS vehicle, but they didn't rent them out. At one point, a friend of Dr. K said he'd let them use his house in Detroit, but the last minute, that friend backed out, got creeped out. So the van it was. Uh, Dr. K informed them that uh, they had no other choice but the van. Uh, Janet was determined to go through with it and said it was fine. So the Atkinses, you know, they flew in June 2nd, meet the doctor at a Red Roof Inn, have lunch, make a tape where they discuss what's going to happen, have dinner with him at a place called Uptown Charlie's that evening. Uh, The tape, which will be later played at the trial, shows three people sitting facing a stationary video camera in front of a pale institutional looking motel room uh, drapes. Janet, a buxom bespeckled woman in a bright plum colored blouse, sits next to her tweedy bearded bow tied husband, Ron, looks like a New England college professor. Janet doesn't seem sick, but evidence of her mental impairment appears. Uh, there's Dr. Jack seeking answers from Janet, getting them mainly from Ron. Kevorkian begins with a traditional effort to see if the patient is located uh, as to time, place, and person. Ask her where she lives. She says, Portland, Oregon. He asks her, where is Portland, Oregon? And she gives an embarrassed laugh. She doesn't know how to answer. Turns to her husband, says, help. Uh, that's the pattern of the rest of the tape. She gives short, passive, one word or one sentence answers, hesitates, turns to her husband, who often jumps in with long descriptive explanations. Viewing the tape, it's hard to tell whether she is embarrassed uh, sometimes or truly has just forgotten something, like the exchange in which Dr. K tries to get her to say the word death. Janet, are you aware of your decision? He asks. Yes. 
what does it mean? You have to get, uh, you have to get out with dignity. Just what is it you want? Put it in simple English. Self-deliverance. No, simple, simpler than that. She laughs, says something inaudible. Do you want to go on? No, I don't want to go on. What does that mean? The end of my life. What's the word for that? Euthanasia. No, what's the word for the end of life? You're dead. All right, is that what you wish? Yes. After their dinner at Uptown Charlie's, they say goodnight after making the following plan. The Atkinses would have a final day together for sightseeing June 3rd, then say goodbye to each other. Man, it's so sad. Uh, then the morning after that, Monday morning, the doctor's two sisters pick Janet up at the Red Roof Inn, drive her to the recreational vehicle hookup area of Groveland Oaks County Park. Ron would stay behind in the motel and wait for the call afterward. Janet didn't want him to witness the procedure. Early on the morning of June 4th, Dr. Kevorkian gets the sodium uh, pentanol barbiturate used to help patients relax before receiving a general anesthesia and the lethal dose of potassium chloride out of a safe where he'd, store, where he'd stored them. He packed the Thanatron and his EKG machine into the van. He's ready. <clears throat> Excuse me. So is Janet. But suddenly everything that could go wrong began to go wrong. First, when he's loading the sodium uh, pent- pentanol, pentothal, Jesus Christ, uh, into vial number two, he manages to spill the special sauce, causes a two-hour delay. He has to go 45 miles back home to get more. Uh, from home, he also uh, brings back little needle nose pliers, do some fine tuning to the chain linkages. Finally, he's ready to hook Janet uh, up to vial number one, the harmless saline solution. Problem there too. He has to try four times before he's able to get the needle properly inserted into her vein. Dear God, she must have been so irritated when she died. Then he worries that the saline isn't flowing fast enough, so he has to jury rig a little box and raise the vial up onto it in order to increase the pressure. Uh, all these little hitches cumulatively have an effect on Janet. She's laying down on a mattress with a needle in her arm. She's telling Dr. K, be careful whenever he handles something delicate. She's fucking annoyed, right? Kind of a big moment, dude. You're kind of making it weird. Finally, everything is ready. Kevorkian's sister, Flora, reads the Lord's Prayer and then a few poems uh, Janet had chosen. The time had come. Dr. K tells her how to flip the switch, demonstrates with the safety on. Then he takes the safety off, starts the cardiogram. It's at this point, Dr. K says that Janet looked like she was rising up to kiss me. The prosecutor would later question him sharply about this perception at a preliminary hearing. Dr. K conceded that he couldn't be sure, he was guessing, that her last surge of life was meant to be a kiss. What does it really matter? Several minutes after the lethal potassium chloride uh, should have kicked in, stopped her heart, the doctor thinks he notices there's still some anomalous activity on the EKG chart, but that was a mistake. Uh, The EKG line had gone flat. Janet Atkins is dead. Immediately after her passing, Kevorkian calls the police who arrest and briefly detain him. Dr. K also uh, also informs Ron, uh, who tried to leave the area quickly on the afternoon of his wife's death and initially tried to evade police questioning. Not until he was in the doorway of an airplane at Detroit's Metropolitan Airport and being questioned by a Michigan State police detective for a second time did he acknowledge he was Janet's husband. He was not detained uh, and leaves for Portland, leaving behind his wife's body and personal effects. He left a cremation or left cremation instructions with the Detroit area funeral home, uh, but the body was held for autopsy by the Oakland County Medical Examiner. Uh, kind of weird that he would bolt like that, I think. Uh, why not wait for her cremation remains and then bring them home personally? If Lindsay helps me die and then immediately ditches me, let it be known. I'm going to haunt the shit out of her. Uh, Ron Atkins and uh, two of his sons then hold a news conference in Portland, read the suicide note Mrs. Atkins had prepared. After the Atkins story reaches the media, Kevorkian becomes a national celebrity, right? Dr. Death, big news. And he'd become more infamous with his subsequent trial. June 8th, 1990, Oakland County Circuit Judge Alice Gilbert issues a preliminary injunction barring Kevorkian from uh, uh, assisting any further suicides in the state. At the same time, the county prosecutor charges him with murder. Kevorkian retains the flamboyant and iconoclastic plaintiff's attorney, Jeffrey Figer, to defend him. At the time, Kevorkian was living in a one-bedroom rental over a florist shop where he spent his time outside of making a little money consulting on death, on articles uh, uh, for European medical journals under titles such as, uh, writing these articles such as the Comprehensive Bioethical Code for the Medical Exploitation of Humans Facing Imminent and an Unavoidable Death. My God. Uh, he didn't care too much for creature comforts, not even fancy food. Mostly lived on heavily salted French fries. He would live until the age of 83 and be skinny and have lots of energy. God damn it, eating fucking heavily salted french fries. Motherfucker. I put on a few pounds if I just look at some french fries now. Uh, December 12th, 1990. District Court Judge Gerald McNally dismisses the murder charges against Kevorkian due to Michigan's indecisive stance on physician-assisted suicide. Not one to be deterred by pesky societal hangups, Dr. K continues. Despite dropping the murder charges, uh, a trial would also continue. It would still take place early 1991. Uh, That trial was the result of the county prosecutor's determination to shut the doctor's suicide services down, whether they were criminal or not. Prosecutor Medelsky sought a permanent injunction to prevent the doctor from ever using his machine in Michigan again. 
and from counting any new patients on how to kill themselves. Modelski told a reporter that he was trying to stop the doctor from roaming around the countryside in his van, zapping people. Pretty funny language. Uh, more urgently, he was trying to prevent the death of at least 50 more people the ones Kevorkians had said were waiting in line to be hooked up to his Stanitron. In Modelski's view, he was asking the court to prevent the doctor from becoming a medical serial killer. And more, if the machine was made widely available, Modelski was fra- uh, afraid it would be all too tempting for those who wanted to take the easy way out. And in some ways, I mean, he has a point here. Uh, many of us have been anesthetized in a hospital for surgeries. Uh, we've experienced slipping easily into unconsciousness via sodium pentanol, pentothol. Uh, I hate that word. Uh, should death be made that easy? There's a million ways to kill yourself in the world, but the vast majority of them require some kind of decisive action, right? The seconds it takes between getting together the supplies and committing the act could be crucial to changing your mind. If it just takes a button, pushing a button, well, that's a much quicker choice. Dr. K's invention made death one of our biggest societal taboos, very user-friendly, perhaps too user-friendly. Uh, Chief Defense Attorney Figer countered that it was, it was not the prosecutor's role to impose his paternalist morality on the citizenry. Yeah, who put Medelsky in charge of his, his paternalism? Uh, acknowledging that Dr. K's beliefs were controversial, Figer said that that was because they forced people to face their own mortality. It stirs up questions, feelings they don't necessarily want to face. They start asking themselves, would I consider using it? Right? I don't think he's wrong there. Uh, the civil trial would quickly grow uh, controversial with a key choice by the prosecution. The Nazi doctors, medical killing, and the psychology of genocide. A uh, notable book by distinguished psychiatrist and historian Robert J. Lifton. Uh, still, still around, still sh- seemingly sharp as ever at 95, by the way. And his book would be a mainstay of the prosecution's case in more ways than one. Lipson argues that there was an inevitable progression from the medicalization of killing introduced by the Nazis uh, in the 30s to the mass murder in the camps in the 40s. At the heart of the Nazi enterprise, Lipson states in a quote that the prosecution would use for their final argument, is the destruction of the boundary between healing and killing, that damn slippery slope. The prosecution decided to place a copy of the thick black Nazi doctor's book conspicuously near the top of a stack of books on the prosecution table, a stack positioned right next to Prosecution Exhibit 10, the confiscated Thanatron. Photographers, TV cameras, folks on the machine couldn't help but capture the stack of books next to it. Big, bold letters in the spine of the Nazi doctors, prominent, uh, looked like a caption to the image of the machine. Essentially, Medelsky believed that the participation by a doctor in killing, even if it's only assisting a voluntary suicide, would be the first step in a dangerous continuum, a slippery slope leading from medically assisted suicide to medically encouraged suicide of, say, the poor and uninsured to medically pressured suicide of those whose lives are not worth living but uh, expensive to to sustain to involuntary euthanasia, right? Murder. Very interesting argument. Not a good one, though, I don't think. Interesting, though. Uh, To me, it's like, uh, no, we can't legalize guns because if we did, the next thing that would uh, be legalized would be uh, everyone being able to shoot just whoever they wanted. Uh, Modelsky making some some crazy leaps of logic with his argument here, I think. Uh, Modelsky passionate about his argument here for personal reasons. He had a grandfather and an uncle die in Auschwitz. Like Kevorkian, he had close ties to the genocide, or to to genocide. Uh, Because the uncle who died was a twin, Modelsky suspected he may have fallen victim to the kinds of medical experiments on twins that were pursued by Dr. Mengele in the camps. Right, The atmosphere in the courtroom, emotional, tense. Things get a little chippy on the last day in court. During an afternoon recess, Jeff Feiger, Dr. K's attorney, tries to shove the stack of books featuring the doctor, Nazi doctors away from the mercy machine, as he called it, so a photographer could snap a picture of the machine without Nazi doctors labeling it. Modelski then tells Feiger to take his hands off the book. He doesn't have the right to touch anything on my table. At this point, seething Dr. Kevorkian walks up to the prosecutor, asks him just what relevance the Nazi doctors has to this case anyway. Modelski says something to the effect of, guys like you were in that book. My family suffered at their hands. Oh, really, says Dr. K? I didn't know the Nazis did animal euthanasia. Ooh, mic drop. Modelski at that point, I imagine, had to really focus on not punching Kevorkian. And it's a good thing he didn't. Because that day, Kevorkian had packed the courtroom with an army of grown butt babies who would have fucking ripped him to shreds if given the code words to attack Emily Blunt. Sorry, hard for me to stop talking about butt babies. Uh, despite Modelsky's passionate argument, more emotion favored Kevorkian in the trial. Overwhelmingly, what the court saw in the civil trial was the families of the dead coming to thank Dr. Kevorkian in droves for helping their loved ones die. They also heard from some patients themselves who had contacted Dr. K. Sherry Miller, 42-year-old mother of three, uh, was so severely affected with multiple sclerosis that the only part of her wheelchair-bound body she could move was her left arm, and she testified on behalf of the defense. After being sworn in, Miller described in loud, quavering voice, barely audible, uh, barely under control, how the disease, um, I'm sorry, it wasn't barely audible, it was barely under control, 
how the disease had progressed, rubbing her, robbing her first of motor control, then control over her bodily functions, finally leaving her helpless, dependent on her aging parents to wash and feed her with uh, even her voice, her last link with this world being slowly strangled in her throat. She described how she'd wanted to find a way out of the terrible prison she'd found her body to be, how Dr. Kevorkian, who she'd first seen on, Donny, on Donahue, seemed to be a godsend. She described how when she asked for his suicide services, he'd encouraged her not to take the ultimate step right away, but to seek further help, how he talked her into getting physical therapy and psychiatric counseling, options her own doctor had never suggested. Then more details come out, like how uh, relieved she had been that at last she'd found a doctor she could talk to, how she'd called him up a half a dozen times just to talk, how he'd given her the strength to try those alternatives because she knew he would be there to help her if they didn't work. And how bitterly disappointed she had been when after therapy and counseling failed to alleviate her suffering and she renewed her request for the doctor's services, she found out it was too late. The preliminary injunction against him denied her his help. I should have ended my life myself, she said angrily toward the close of her testimony. Instead of waiting to where I can't do anything on my own, I can't get pills now, I can't get to them, I can't get a gun. And how do you ask somebody to end your life? The prosecutor, prosecutor says Dr. Kevorkian is a threat to you. Figer said that he'll talk you into suicide. I'm the one who's making the decision, she said, painfully struggling to talk through paralyzed vocal muscles. Nobody else. And I want that right. I mean, look at me. I want the right to die and I want the right to have help. The defense rested after the testimony of Virginia Bernero, mother of the late Victor Bernero, who had died of AIDS a year earlier. She described her son's final days, how he sank into dementia, how the medical community made promises but didn't help, help them much. She talked about how she couldn't afford nursing care, how her son had begged to be strapped to his bed in a straitjacket because he was hearing voices that told him to get a knife. She told the court how one night he was expelled from a nursing home because they couldn't handle him, how crazed with fear he was handcuffed, shoved into the back of a police car, locked away in a crisis center cell. Then she wasn't allowed to see him for days until he was transferred to a hospital psychiatric ward. When she came to get Victor, she said he was totally dehydrated. His lips were bleeding like an animal. It was then that he begged to die. He was frightened of death and told me, I want to go now. Please give me the whole bottle of pills. Uh, I couldn't give it to him simply because I didn't think it would kill him. Mrs. Bernero said, I didn't have the heart. I thought it would make him more ill. The prosecution had a tricky role to play. They needed to prove despite everyone saying that Dr. K was a nice man and a good doctor who was helping that he was doing that. What he was doing was building that slippery slope that led to a eugenics plant. To do so, the prosecution relied heavily on the testimony of three nationally known medical ethicists. Dr. Nancy Dickey, former chairwoman on the AMA's Council on Ethical and Judicial Affairs, Arthur Kaplan, director of the Center for Biomedical Ethics at the University of Minnesota, Dr. Leon Cass, senior scholar at the University of Chicago Center for Clinical Medical Ethics. It was Cass's testimony that was the most powerful and thought-provoking. Cass was candid enough to admit on the stand that he had to wrestle with the doctor-assisted suicide question in the case of his own mother. In her terminal decline, he said his mother had begged him several times to help her die. He repeatedly turned down his own mother's anguished pleas for relief, Cass said, a decision he claimed was vindicated when she came down with pneumonia and he asked her if she wanted to be taken to the hospital to have it treated. And she said, yes, she wanted treatment. Uh, the goal of causing death goes beyond the role to accept medical practice, Cass told the court. The separation between healing and killing is at the very heart of what makes doctors part of a moral profession, not a set of hired syringes. Breaching that separation can lead to terrible consequences. He argued that trust would be fatally undermined if a patient knew that a doctor who came to heal him might also consider the option of killing him. Dr. Cass also delivered a powerful argument against giving doctors what he called a license to kill by assisting suicides. He described conversation on the subject he had with a colleague who for years worked in a hospice. The hospice doctor told Cass that the truly disturbing consequence of legitimizing doctor-assisted suicide would be that in practice, no matter how many safeguards were set up, the individuals who would make up a disproportionate number of doctor-sanctioned suicides would be troublesome patients with no families, the lonely and the friendless, the indigent, the uninsured, who seem to have lives not worth living. You know, not his words, but what people's, uh, people's opinions he's assuming. This would be the, these would be the ones who would be pushed into ending it by doctors who overtly or subtly communicated to them that they were better off dead. That, particularly in an age of pressure for medical economic triage, where shrinking funds have to be appropriated between the living and the dying, the consent of the debilitated and the weak and the poor might be subtly manipulated and misconstrued. The poor in-state supported institutions with minimal care to begin with would make up the greater share of those who chose to die that way. And this whole argument is, of course, speculative, but I think it's very interesting food for thought. Not something I would have considered on my own and not something I think would happen. It hasn't happened in the Netherlands, but feels unfair not to include it today. Uh, well, the argument worked. 
Uh, on February 5th, the judge in the Kevorkian case issued a ruling against the doctor making the temporary injunction permanent. He was now officially barred from using his machine in Michigan and permanently enjoined from employing any device to assist a person in committing suicide. Nonetheless, the court did release his machine back to him. His attorney, his attorney began to appeal the ruling. The injunction would not get Dr. Death to stop. October 23rd, 1991. Kevorkian is, attending, uh, is the attending physician at the deaths of Marjorie Wants, 58-year-old woman from Sotus, Michigan, who suffered from pelvic pain, Sherry Miller, 43-year-old woman from Roseville, Michigan, who suffered from MS. Both deaths occurred at a Renda State Park cabin near Lake Orion, Michigan. Following the two deaths, Michigan judge issues an injunction barring Kevorkian's use of a new machine called the Metaside machine. Uh, November of 1991, Kevorkian's Michigan medical license is revoked now by the State Board of Medicine. Then, when a medical examiner ruled that the deaths of Marjorie Wants and Sherry Miller were homicides, Kevorkian charged in February 1992 with two counts of murder, one count of illegally providing a controlled substance. While on bail awaiting his trial, Kevorkian frequently contacted by more terminally ill members of their families asking for help. To ensure the comfort of those he assisted and to protect himself against further criminal charges, he begins requiring documentation of a person's wish to die. Family phys physicians, mental health professionals, social workers, religious leaders are consulted. His patients have at least a, a month to consider their decision and possibly change their minds. Kevorkian's sister, Margaret, videotapes his consultations with Metaside families. He also speaks on the phone and corresponds with the California dentist who seeks assistance in constructing a Metaside machine to end his life. Oakland County Circuit Court Judge David Breck dismisses charges against Kevorkian in the deaths of Miller and Wants July 21st, 1992, but Oakland County, uh, County Prosecutor Richard Thompson appeals the decision. September 22nd, 1992. Lois Hawes, 52, a worn Michigan woman with lung and brain cancer, dies from carbon monoxide poisoning at the home of Kevorkian's assistant, Neil Nickel, in Waterford Township, Township, Michigan. Remember Neil? He was only available to assist in this suicide because it wasn't his week to care for his butt baby, Emily. He'd fought for custody after giving her for adoption and won joint custody with Blunt's adoptive parents. Good for him. November 23rd, 1992, Catherine Andreev of Moon Township, Pennsylvania, dies in Neil's home, 45, and has cancer. Hers is the first of 10 deaths Kevorkian attends over the next three months. All die from inhaling carbon monoxide. December 3rd, 1992, the state of Michigan passes a bill's outline, outline assisted suicide to take effect March 30th, 93. But Kevorkian would get in another one under the wire. February 15th, 93, Kevorkian helps Hugh Gale, 73-year-old man with emphysema and congestive heart disease, die of carbon monoxide poisoning uh, in Hugh's Roseville, Michigan home or dioxide, excuse me. Uh, prosecutors later discovered papers that showed Kevorkian altered his account of Gail's death, deleting a reference to a request by Gail to halt the procedure. According to a rough draft of a report drawn up by Kevorkian, 70-year-old Hugh twice asked Kevorkian to remove a mask that was connected to deadly carbon monoxide gas. Uh, so, sorry, monoxide, I, I wrote dioxide once, mistakenly. Uh, police say Kevorkian removed the mask the first time but failed to take it off the second time. However, Kevorkian's attorney, Jeffrey Figer, denied that Gail changed his mind said that a document obtained by police from a right to life group was a rough draft, contained an error corrected by Dr. K. Gail's wife, Cheryl, who attended his death, also disputed the account. Uh, asked, yeah, she said he only asked once to have the mask removed, and then it was. Uh, February 25th, 1993, Michigan Governor John Engler signs legislation banning assisted suicide. It makes aiding in a suicide a four-year felony, but allows the law to expire after a Blue Ribbon Commission study if they find evidence, you know, that, uh, that this is not the right call. April 27th, 93, a California judge suspends Kevorkian's medical license after a request from that state's medical board, but he still won't stop. August 9th, 1993, Thomas Hyde, 30-year-old Novi, Michigan man with ALS, found dead in Kevorkian's van on Belle Isle, a Detroit park. A month later, September 9th, hours after a judge ordered Kevorkian to stand trial in Hyde's death, uh, Kevorkian present at the death of cancer patient Donald O'Keefe, 73, in Redford Township, Michigan. Jailed in Detroit after refusing to post $20,000 bond in the case involving Thomas's death, Kevorkian fasts from November 5th to the 8th uh, before being released. In October of 93, Kevorkian charged in the uh, death of 72-year-old Marion Frederick of Ann Arbor, Michigan, also suffered from ALS. Dr. K held in Oakland County Jail for refu refusing to post $50,000 bond. Kevorkian then begins another fast from November 29th to December 17th. Leaves jail after an Oakland County Circuit Court judge reduces his bond to 100 bucks in exchange for Kevorkian's vow not to assist more suicides. Uh, another big trial of Kevorkian's begins in Pontiac, April 19th, 94. The prosecution charges him with murder by administrating drugs to Thomas Hyde. Uh, the trial administering. Uh, the trial was presided over by Judge Thomas Jackson. Richard Thompson led the prosecution. Kevorkian represented again by Jeffrey Figer. And Figer helped Kevorkian escape conviction by successfully arguing 
that no one, literally no one, knew where the fuck my dad was when Thomas Hyde died. How many people did he kill before dad watched? Finally started keeping tabs uh, on the sick, deranged killer, right? How many other dads were fucking killing? No, sorry. Uh, Figer helped Kevorkian escape conviction by successfully arguing that a person may not be found guilty of criminally assisting a suicide if they administered medication with the intent to relieve pain and suffering, even if that disease did increase the risk of death. Jury finds Kevorkian guilty uh, of violating the Michigan law that prohibited assisted suicide in the case of Hyde, but not guilty of murder Uh, on May 2nd, 1994. Eight days later, May 10th, the Michigan Court of Appeals declares that the state's 1993 ban on assisted suicide was enacted unlawfully. So Jack doesn't get in any trouble. Goes back to assisting suicides now. November 26, 94, hours after Michigan's ban on assisted suicide expires, uh, 72-year-old Margaret Garrish dies of carbon monoxide poisoning in her home in Royal Oak. Uh, She had arthritis, osteoporosis, complained of being in constant debilitating, incurable pain. Uh, Kevorkian not present when police arrive. December 13th, the state legislature failed to reach agreement on a bill that would make the ban on assisted suicide indefinite. Same day, the Michigan Supreme Court rules that assisting in suicide, while not specifically prohibited, was a common law felony and that there was no protected right to suicide assistance under the state constitution. This ruling reinstates cases against Kevorkian, right? Who's now busy with new ventures. He's dealing with a lot of shit. Uh, Kevorkian tries opening a medicide clinic in Springfield Township, Michigan, June 26, 95. Names the clinic after his sister, Margaret, who died in 1994. Uh, Kevorkian referred to a physician-assisted suicide by euthanasia as medicide, right? Uh, The people he assisted were consulting patients uh, or medicide patients. He reasoned that his role was of a consulting doctor, or that his role was, yeah, as a consulting doctor because he did not provide treatment as he would a traditional doctor by helping patients overcome or control a disease in order to live. The first and only Metaside Clinic patient was 60-year-old Kansas City, Missouri woman, uh, Erica Garcilano, who had ALS. But just a few days later, the clinic is evicted by the building's new uh, by the building's owner when they find out what the fuck's going on there. September 14th, 1995, Kevorkian arrives at the Oakland County Courthouse, Pontiac, Michigan, in homemade stocks with a ball and chain. Wanted to make a show out of another trial. Mock how puritanical and antiquated the charges against him were. He's ordered to stand trial for assisting the 91 suicides of Sherry Miller and Marjorie Wants. October 30th, a group of doctors, other medical experts in Michigan announced their support of Kevorkian, saying they would uh, uh, set up, you know, uh, draw up a set of principles for the merciful, dignified, medically assisted termination of life. Interesting turn of events. February 1st, 96, the New England Journal of Medicine publishes results of a massive study of physicians' attitudes towards doctor-assisted suicide. The study demonstrated that a large number of physicians surveyed supported doctor-assisted suicide under some conditions, of course. Oregon had been the first state to legalize it uh, when you know voters passed a Restricted Death with Dignity Act in October of 94. It will be enacted in a few years. Uh, another murder, dry, murder trial for Kevorkian begins February 20th, 96 in Pontiac, Michigan. Now charged in the deaths of Marion Frederick and Dr. Ali Khalili, or Khalili, excuse me, 61 of Oak Brook, Illinois, who suffered from bone cancer, who died in November 1993. Both deaths occurred in Kevorkian's apartment. Uh, the trial is assigned to Judge David Breck. Once again, Richard Thompson leads the prosecution. Once again, Figer leads the defense. Thompson argues that Kevorkian had acted reckless, recklessly, failed to discuss other options with the deceased family physicians. Deceased family physicians. Frederick's and Khalili's family members, though, testify for the defense. Uh, by expressing appreciation that Kevorkian ended their loved one's suffering. So take that. While this case is being decided, it seems like maybe the national tide turned in favor of Kevorkian. Uh, May 6, 1996, uh, the Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in San Francisco rules that mentally competent, terminally ill adults have a constitutional right to aid in dying from di- from doctors, healthcare workers, and family members. First time in U.S. federal appeals court history uh, that they'd endorsed assisted suicide. Then on March 8th, 1996, the jury acquits Kevorkian. He spent an awful lot of time in court, but he is winning. Uh, But more trials, government interference is coming. March 20th, 96, Michigan Representative Dave Camp introduces a bill in the U.S. House to prohibit taxpayer funding of assisted suicide. Yet another uh, trial began almost immediately after Kevorkian's second acquittal, April 16th, 1996, now charged in assisting the deaths of Marjorie Wants, Sherry Miller, Way back in 1991, fucking Michigan really had a hard on for this guy. They really just can't fucking stop trying to nail him. The prosecution challenges Kevorkian's judgment when he determined whether Marjorie Wants was mentally competent to make the decision to end her own life as three psychiatrists had diagnosed her as mentally ill, recommended she receive counseling. Kevorkian faces a maximum of five years, $10,000 fine if convicted. And he would make quite a show at this trial. He's an old pro with these witch trials now. 
His winning streaks making him cocky. For the start of the trial, he wears a colonial costume, wears tights, a white powdered wig, big buckle shoes, right? Protesting how this shit is, uh, you know, fucking like uh, this trial was fell under a centuries old common law. Uh, once again, Dr. K is acquitted by the jury, May 14th, 96. He's undefeated against substantial criminal charges. Then on November 4th, 96, Kevorkian's lawyer announces a previously unreported assisted suicide of a 50-year-old woman, bringing the official total number of his assisted suicides since 1990 to 46. Uh, Ionia County Circuit Judge Charles Meal declares a mistrial in another Dr. Kevorkian assisted suicide trial, June 12th, 1997. That case later dropped. June 6, 97, the U.S. Supreme Court rules unanimously that state governments have the right to outlaw doctor-assisted suicide. Uh, Oregon then enacts the Death with Dignity Act in October 27th, 1997. Right? So much stuff happening. March 14th, 1998 marks uh, Kevorkian's 100th assisted suicide involving a 66-year-old Detroit man. Between September and October of 98, the Michigan legislature enacts another law, this one making assisted suicide a felony punishable by a maximum five-year prison sentence. They also uh, close a loophole that allowed for Kevorkian's previous acquittals. They're so against what he's doing, Right. Uh, he can't quit and neither apparently can they. November 22nd, 1998, 60 Minutes at CBS show airs a video recording of the lethal injection administered by Dr. Kevorkian to Thomas Yauk, 52, an ALS patient who had requested Kevorkian's help. On the recording, Kevorkian seen actively helping Yauk administer the drugs. Uh, this is significant because he had reported earlier that, you know, all the metacide patients had, you know, they completed the process themselves. Uh, that they pushed the, the final syringe, the final button, whatever. This difference will fuck him. Well, that and publicizing what he did in the biggest way possible at the time. Uh, he allows the tape to be aired on 60 Minutes. Uh, host Mike Wallace asks him a series of questions. Uh, you were engaged in a political, medical, macabre publicity venture, right? Probably. And in watching these tapes, I get the feeling there's something almost ghoulish in your desire to see the deed done. Well, that could be. Doesn't come across very likable here. November 25th, 1998, Michigan now charges Kevorkian with first degree uh, with murder, uh, violating the assisted suicide law, delivering a controlled substance without a license in the death of Yauk. Prosecutors later dropped the suicide charge. I think initially they declared uh, first degree uh, murder. They drop it to second degree murder. Uh, Kevorkian makes the mistakes of deciding to defend himself during the trial, threatens to starve himself if he's sent to jail, shouldn't have defended himself. He's confrontational, self-righteous, not the skilled defense attorney Figer is. Uh, I think that Dr. Kevorkian's main fault was being a lot smarter than just about everyone else around him, especially smarter than his most strident critics, judges, and prosecutors. And he knew he was smarter and he let them know that. And that tactic does not often work out well. Uh, March 26, 99, a jury in Oakland County, Michigan convicts Kevorkian of second degree murder and the illegal delivery of a controlled substance. In April, Judge Jessica R. Cooper sentences him to 10 to 25 years in prison with the possibility of parole. She would say, this is a court of law. And you said you invited yourself here to take a final stand. But this trial was not an opportunity for a referendum. The law prohibiting euthanasia was specifically reviewed and clarified by the Michigan Supreme Court several years ago in a decision involving your very own cases, sir. So the charge here should come as no surprise to you. You invited yourself to the wrong forum. Well, we are a nation of laws and we are a nation that tolerates differences of opinion because we have a civilized and a nonviolent way of resolving our conflicts that weighs the law and adheres to the law. We have the means and the methods to protest, protest the laws with which we disagree. You can criticize the law. You can write or lecture about the law. You can speak to the media or petition the voters. But you can't break it without consequences. Kevorkian sent to prison in Coldwater, Michigan to serve a sentence. During the next three years, Kevorkian unsuccessfully attempts to pursue uh, the conviction in appeals court. Lawyers representing Kevorkian seek to bring the case before the U.S. Supreme Court, but that request declined. While in prison, Kevorkian refuses to let his imprisonment break him, keeps his mind very active, continues to write. He prepares essays that accompany art, music, photograph uh, photographs, books, poetry, uh, all included in an exhibit titled The Doctor is In, The Art of Dr. Jack Kevorkian. Opens in September 1999 at the Armenian Library and Museum of America in Watertown, Massachusetts. April of 2000, while in prison, Kevorkian receives the Glitzman Citizen Activist of the Year Award and a sculpture designed by Maya Lin creator of the Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, D.C. 2002, uh, Kevorkian participates through written questions in a program on death and dying at Oklahoma City University. Same year, Kevorkian, while still in prison, nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, stays busy in prison. August 2003, uh, is called to give uh, deposition as an expert witness on medical research on the effect of mercury on human tissue, 
based on early writings on the subject, uh, prepares articles for the New York Times, uh, the William Sapphire column on language, Forbes, uh, Popular Mechanics, New York Review of Books, The Nation, American Journal of Forensic Psychiatry, on and on. For prison in 2004, he writes, look at the forces against me, the government, the American Medical Association, pharmaceutical companies, and religion. Is there anything more powerful than those four? Mm, certainly are four heavy hitters. Uh, in his cell, prisoner 284797 also wrote poetry, composed music for the flute. Uh, he imagined an international eBay-style eBay auction site for organ trafficking. He even bought a domain, viscous.org. Uh, wrote books, uh, Glimmer IQs, an anthology on previous research and new material on philosophy, medicine, mathematics, religion, history, etc. Uh, wrote Amendment 9, our cornucopia of rights in 2005, a book on the subject of the U.S. Bill of Rights. And in 2007, Kevorkian started working on Dear Dr. Jack, using selected letters out of the thousands written to him by supporters during his incarceration. In an MSNBC interview aired on September 29, 2005, Kevorkian said that if he were granted parole, he would not resume directly helping people die and would restrict himself to campaigning to have the laws changed. He wants out, but not yet. December 22, 2005, Kevorkian denied parole. Uh, but then, a year and a half later, after eight years in prison, June 1st, 2007, he is paroled for good behavior, released from the Lakeland Correctional Facility. Uh, he's paroled for, uh, to be on parole for two years. Under conditions, he not assist anyone else in dying or provide care for anyone older than 62 or disabled. Keep him away from Nana. He'll push a pillow down on her face. First chance he gets. He's, he's bloodthirsty. Jesus. Uh, Jack also for, forbidden by the rules of his parole from even commenting about assisted suicide for two years. Kevorkian said he would abstain from assisting any more terminal patients with metacide. He would restrict his role to persuading states to change laws on assisted suicide. By this time, Kevorkian himself not doing well, suffering from liver damage due to advanced hepatitis C, right? That disease he gave himself decades earlier with that corpse blood. Uh, despite not feeling too well, 2008, at the age of 79, Kevorkian decides to run as an independent candidate for the U.S. Congress against Republican Joe Kralenberg, or uh, Gro, God, God damn it, Joe Nolenberg and Democrat Gary Peters, uh, he gets less than 3% of the vote. Again, despite numerous legal victories uh, for the common man, not a likable guy. Not going to get many religious votes especially. Also in 2008, he begins working on another book, When the People Bubble Pops, about the dangers of overpopulation. Uh, I wonder what he would have thought of the, uh, the Purge movies. 2009, Kevorkian lectured to more than 5,000 students at the University of Florida, Wayne State University, many other colleges. Following year, he writes on the subject of the Ninth Amendment in the form of a Bill of Rights of Natural Rights. Ninth Amendment summarized states that the federal government doesn't own the rights that are not listed in the Constitution, but instead they belong to us, the citizens. This means that the rights that are specified in the Constitution are not the only ones people should be limited to. He also prepared another anthology of his early research. Uh, spoke to the Armenian Association at UCLA, met with the executive team of the HBO film You Don't Know Jack. Uh, production began in 2005 while Kevorkian was still imprisoned. Uh, the film, as I mentioned, features Al Pacino, Jack Kevorkian, Brenda Ficaro, Margaret Janis, uh, Susan Sarandon as Janet Good, Danny Houston as Jeffrey Figer, and John Goodman as Neil Nickel. Looks like it was a good movie. 83% fav favorable ratings uh, from both critics and the public on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, film was released April 24, 2010, nominated for 15 Emmys, one, two. Al Pacino won Prime, uh, Primetime Emmy, Golden Globe, and Screen Actors Guild Awards for his performance as Kevorkian. And Kevorkian would attend the 2010 Emmy Awards in LA, where Pacino would ask him to stand before the world. Then a little over a year later, Kevorkian dies Friday, June 3rd, 2011, at William Beaumont Hospital in Royal Oak, Michigan. With him were Emily Blunt, several other butt babies, uh, like Corey Feldman and Tom Cruise. Come on. Uh, no, with him were his niece, Ava Janis, and his attorney and friend, Meyer Morgan Roth. Kevorkian was 83. His old attorney, Mr. Figer, said that uh, Dr. Kevorkian, weakened as he lay in the hospital, could not take advantage of the option that he had offered others and that he had wished for himself. This is something I would want, Kevorkian said. If he had enough strength to do something about it, he would have, Mr. Figer said at a news conference in Southfield, Michigan. Had he been able to go home, Jack Kevorkian probably would have not allowed himself to go back to the hospital. Kevorkian was buried in Whitechapel Memorial Park Cemetery, Troy, Michigan. The epitaph on his tombstone reads, he sacrificed himself for everyone's rights. Now let's hop out of that big old timeline. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. Dr. Jack Kevorkian, Dr. Death. Very interesting guy. 
Man of convictions, principles. You might not agree with his convictions and principles, but he sure as shit did not back down when it came to what he believed in. And I do admire that. So was he, as I asked at the start of the episode, a good guy? I think he was, but also just a real unlikable guy to many, right? He could have definitely worked harder to make his pills easier to swallow. Uh, He equated anyone disagreeing with him to persecution. He openly disobeyed the law. He didn't use the channels open to every U.S. citizen to create lasting change in the system, voting, organizing. Instead, for many years, he went lone rogue uh, wolf, right? I think there's some merit to the criticisms of his detractors. What if something had gone seriously wrong with uh, some of his assisted suicides? What if he'd hurt someone for life, made their bad life circumstances they wanted to escape from worse? Dr. Kevorkian was running an operation with zero oversight, and with zero oversight, mistakes are bound to happen. The death of Janet Atkins was almost botched several times before she died. Also, was his primary goal to create change or was it to become infamous? With him, hard to tell sometimes. Jeffrey Figer, Kevorkian's lawyer, you know, during the 90s, excuse me, gave a speech at a press conference in which he stated, Dr. Jack didn't seek out history, but he made history. But is that true? Didn't he seek out history? Didn't he want to be the face of the physician-assisted suicide movement? A 2005 or 2015 retro report story about Kevorkian's legacy and the right to die movement uh, may have gotten the best when they said that Kevorkian got a national debate going, which I think he then helped stifle by his own outrageous actions. Yeah, I agree. Uh, His inflammatory behavior might have hurt his cause more than helped it. But he did get people talking uh, and there was a lot of merit in that. You know, he got me to think about death more than I would have without him. And uh, at the end of this all, you know, what do you think? Should you have the right to die how you want? I think you should. And if you've listened to the show for any length of time, you know that I am not pro-suicide. I am pro-keep fighting. I'm pro, you know, try your damnedest to find something to live for. But if you're in pain, chronic, relentless pain, if your body and or mind are deteriorating and there is nothing you can do to stop it, if what makes you, you just keep slipping away day after day and you want to leave the party before the keg runs dry, so to speak, and all the fun's over, Why the fuck should I try and stop you? Why should anyone? It feels so cruel and selfish to me. Only you know how much pain you can handle. Only you walk in your shoes. What if you've tried counseling? You visited specialists and the prognosis is still just fucking grim and you don't want to fight for every extra day or hour so you can still keep breathing while in so much pain, mounting pain, while the mind and or body is degrading. In cases like that, I firmly believe you should be able to end your days. That is a freedom I support 100%. To me, it feels indecent not to. It feels inhumane. And that is why I think Dr. Death was a good guy. He fought for what I think is an important freedom. And really at the end of the day, uh, he wasn't pro-death. Like he said, he was pro-life. You know, part of living is dying. And just like I want to have the most freedoms I can while I'm alive, looking at you outdated, you're not my fucking mom, Uncle Sam drug laws. I also want to have the most freedom possible when it comes to how I die. Death. Never thought of it as a tricky subject before, but I guess it is. From the early history of ancestor worship and skull cults to covering mirrors when someone dies to the modern funeral industry, we humans have tried for so long to get death right. To do the thing that makes sense as a species to honor the part of the person that still lives in us and to ensure our own continuity as the one still living. It's an incredibly hard thing to do. Dr. K tried to give us more control and perhaps a greater sense of dignity when it comes to our deaths. And for that, I applaud his efforts. Now let's look at today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, according to his lawyer, Jeffrey Figer, Kevorkian assisted in the deaths of 130 terminally ill people between 1990 and 1998. He used his Thanatron or death machine to allow patients to deliver lethal injections to themselves. Number two, Jack Kevorkian was convicted of second degree murder of Thomas Yoke on March 26, 1999, ultimately served eight years in prison released in 2007, partly because he was suffering from advanced liver failure as a result of hepatitis C, an infection he had gotten years earlier. Uh, Speaking of, number three, Kevorkian's strange and bizarre experiments started long before he began experimenting with the Thanatron. In the 70s, he experimented with infusing blood from corpses into living human beings. Given himself hep C in the process, uh, he took close-up photographs of terminally ill patients Uh, I'm sorry, of dead patients, uh, recently deceased patients trying to pinpoint the moment of death. He even once requested a fetus to implant in his male lab partner stomach, a request that was not allowed. Maybe he should have requested the fetus to be implanted a little lower than the stomach in the colon. Come on, Bob, babies, let's let's make some monsters. Somebody figure it out. Uh, Number four, we meet sacks of long struggle with how to deal with how much control we should have over our own deaths. 
Euthanasia has been thought of sometimes as incredibly humane, other times as the moral equivalent of the Nazis eugenics program. Uh, Number five, new info. Are you ready for some weird death facts? Uh, When air and gas leave in a corpse uh, or left in a corpse, start to escape to the throat and nose, they can make the vocal cords vibrate, resulting in a noise that sounds like a groan. Can you imagine working in a funeral home and hearing that for the first time? Also, didn't know this either. uh, After you die, your eyeballs flatten. Uh, One mortician compared this flattening of the eyeball to uh, that of an old grape that looks deflated. To keep eyes looking plump during funeral services, eye caps are often placed under the eyelids to recreate the shape the eyeballs had during life. Jesus. Speaking of morticians, uh, the term mortician was invented as part of a PR campaign by the funeral industry, which felt it was more customer friendly than undertaker. Uh, The term was chosen after a call for ideas in Embalmers Monthly. I wonder what terms came in second and third place. Maybe a cadaver grabber. Or how about uh, carcass artist? That's the one. That's the one I I wish would have won. Carcass artist. Has a nice little flow to it. Let's get out of here. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Dr. Death's Jack of Orkin and the right to die debate has been sucked. I mean, you long think about butt babies. Totally unnecessary, but I enjoyed it in this episode. Uh, I mean, you long think about ghost dick as well. Thanks to the Bad uh, Magic Productions team. Thanks to Queen of Bad Magic, Lindsay Cummins. To the Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley for production. Uh, thanks to Bit Elixir for upkeep on the Time Suck app. Logan the Art Warlock Keith creating the merch, badmagicmerch.com for running socials with Liz the Enchantress Hernandez. Thanks to the All Seen Eyes moderating the Cult of Curious private Facebook page. And to Beefsteak and his mod squad running Discord. Next week, we return to true crime. To some serial killing with the story of Robert Yates a serial killer who was active about 30 minutes from where I record every week in Spokane, Washington. And he was active when I was going to school at Spokane in, uh, at Gonzaga University. Before he was caught, a few of my friends actually thought they partied with him one night after some drinks at the Chef, a bar that no longer exists. I thought they did too for a bit. Uh, he was killing women just a mile or two from campus. We talked about him a lot. Uh, we were shocked at who he was when he was caught. Murdered at least 11 women in Spokane, then confessed to two murders committed in Walla Walla and to the murders of another three women in Western Washington. At least 16 women died at his hands, all between 1975 and 1998. He was caught in 2000, and he was living quite the double life before he got caught. When he wasn't targeting sex workers, uh, he appeared to be, to his friends and neighbors, a great family guy. Devoted husband, loving father of four daughters and a son with his second wife, Linda. He was a veteran who served 21 and a half years in the military. And he might have killed, probably would have killed for even longer than he did if one of his would-be victims hadn't finally lived to report him, just barely after being shot and beaten. A killer roamed the same streets I did in the mid-90s, a dude I might have bumped into at the grocery store, and we will talk about him next week here on Time Suck. Uh, Right now, let's head on over to this week's Time Sucker updates. Updates? Get your Time Sucker updates. First up, a little sex alien love, based in last week's Suck uh, on realism, from sexy alien lover. Tony Montfanat, Tony Manfatano. Uh, hello, Dan. First time writer, uh, sucker, chiming in from Nashville. Tony writes, I found your show years ago through the Tom and Dan podcast. Love Tom and Dan, meteor time. Uh, my wife and I saw you in Nashville a few years ago at the last show before COVID shut everything down. Hope you come back. I will in the fall, actually. Uh, in regard to the realism suck, in no way whatsoever am I sticking up for this guy's rampant douchebaggery, but I know you always take caution to look at things from all angles. So to play devil's advocate, if he did catch a glimpse of heaven or was visited by some alien race, it would make sense that all those entities would be beautiful. Uh, if it was angels, they would all be divinely attractive, made in God's image, given God is not some nerd in his mom's basement who figured out world building. Uh, maybe. Uh, and if it was an alien race who figured out cloning, it would stand to reason they would clone the most beautiful people. Now imagine seeing that through the eyes of a perpetually horny human man. This, of course, does not excuse any of the more untoward facets of his religion. Sexual liberation and equality for all sexual proclivities is not a bad thing as long as those principles transfer to all other aspects of the human experience, which obviously did not for him as an example by the fact that it only benefited his desires. If he took all the self-serving out of his beliefs and spread the ideals to other areas like race relations, interpersonal relationships, and work-life balance, it wouldn't be all that bad. Anyway, just the thoughts of a lowly space lizard. Keep on sucking, Tony. Well, thank you, Tony. Uh, yeah, man. Uh, I mean, the ideals of this utopia, he imagined. Yeah, fucking great. I would love a world where we are all super attractive and we get to come all the time. Don't have to work too much, uh, you know, because robots are doing the work and we're not burdened with jealousy and other negative aspects of the human condition. 
uh, certain aspects of what he, you know, plagiarized from ancient alien authors uh, fuck, sound fucking fantastic, you know? Uh, and, you know, maybe could have happened. I can't prove any of this stuff, uh, you know, didn't happen. I just don't think old Claude saw the shit he claimed, as I doubt you do either. But yeah, a, a world of immortality through being able to slip into some uh, new meat sack body when yours runs down, a world with a machine in every home that makes, excuse me, every kind of food imaginable, every body uh, for sexual fulfillment. Well, hail Lucifina, sign me up. All right, now how about a little inspiration? Super Sack John Huff is back. He writes, greetings, Time Suck team. First off, I just want to say I started listening to the show during the two-part episode on JFK. I've been hooked ever since. Thank you. Proved to be an excellent escape from my dead-end job at the time. The show got me through my divorce, some of the darkest times of my life. Unfortunately, along the way, I made a mess of my life in ways that I still, uh, still wake me up at night. I developed a love and later a need for alcohol. For a while, it became my personality. It wasn't until I heard one of your year-end wrap-ups that I became inspired to take a chance on me. Fast forward to today, I'm two years into an apprenticeship program in the same trade and a year clean and sober upon writing this. Fuck yeah. Uh, I discovered the show was edutainment pretty quickly, which I didn't count on. Uh, or what I didn't count on was that it would soon change me in the best ways. The show challenged my beliefs and morals for the better. Also gave me hope to know that there's people out there that are just as curious and weird as I am. Again, thank you for all you guys do. Hail Nimrod. Well, nice work, you fellow fucking weirdo. Go get some of that ghost puss. Treat yourself. Uh, No, good job taking a chance on yourself. Hail Nimrod. Uh, You know, best bet you can make is on yourself. Never going to have as much control over the outcome as you do uh, on that investment and any other investment. So fuck yeah. I love hearing what you've done and now you're going to be inspiring other people. Keep crushing, John. I inspire you. You inspire me and others right back. Uh, We just keep the circle going. Thank you. Quick, funny Betty White related message from Betty White Power Fan. JK, come on. Uh, Brett Davis. Uh, Brett writes... I love that Brett writes, oh, I guess it's Brett and Betty don't rhyme. What am I talking about? Hey, Master Sucker, uh, Brett from Michigan here. Fairly new listener, but loving every episode I've listened to so far. Keep listening, they'll probably be a few, you know. Uh, no, I discovered Time Suck by accident when I couldn't sleep and decided that a podcast would help put me to sleep. Silly me, the episode was on the Nexium cult and it had the opposite effects and I ended up pulling an all-nighter. <laughs> Sweet. Uh, just finished the Betty White episode and she truly is a legend. I found this meme that I've attached to this email. It is... Uh, <laughs> Uh, something I remember about Betty White at the end of, from the end of 2021. Hail Nimrod, pros, but praise Bojangles, Brett Davis. Yeah, this meme is, uh, you know, pick a Betty, uh, kind of pulling her sunglasses down. Uh, and it is captioned, I love this, Betty White didn't die. No, no, no. She grabbed 2021 by the throat and whispered in its ear, I'm taking you with me, you son of a bitch. And then she threw them both into the fires of Mordor to save us all. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. It is canon. Deal with it. Yes, love it. Love Betty White. Thank you, Brett. Everyone's getting drilled. All holes must be filled. Classic Betty. And now one last one relating to some of what we talked about in the 2017 Las Vegas shooting suck a few weeks back. Stand up sack Nick Guerrero uh, writes, 6th March, year of our Lord, 2022. Dearest Daniel, keeper Bojangles and gesture of Lucifina. It has been a fortnight since our last frolic and my bosom yearns for you. Fuck it. I can't do an entire message like that. I'm not creative enough. That was good. That was good, Nick. Let me go ahead and apologize in advance for the length of this email as I don't know how long this will take. I'm writing in to provide a little info on why some of these conspiracy theorists jack off so hard to the Sandy Hook shooting. Given my current geographic positioning, there's quite a few truthers in my area and most of them make Second Amendment loving, the whole Bill of Rights, really, uh, right of center leaning. That doesn't mean I'm right wing and I hate all other political ideals. Uh, I hate many right wing ideas too. Lucifina, I hate having to qualify every statement now. Uh, Meet sacks like myself who want to waterboard them with gasoline. <laughs> now that all that's out of the way, I know an Alex Jones truther, great guy, smart guy, but makes me want to bash myself in the head with my 32-ounce ball-peen hammer until I'm deaf when he goes on a rant about some deep state bullshit. He dove heavy into the conspiracy theory pool, started spouting off about all kinds of batshit theories. At one point, after sheer force of will and grinding me down, he had me watch an InfoWars episode with him. I lasted about three minutes before standing and saying, this is the dumbest shit I've ever seen. How can you watch this? He supports none of his claims with any actual evidence. I'm a moron and I can see that. His only real response uh, is that you, can't, that you can't argue with is the government is scrubbing all the answers. A perfect answer because you can never prove one way or the other that they are or are not doing that. It's as beautiful as it is simple and stupid. Now I say all that to, or now I say all that to tell you this next part. Shortly after the attempted truth was indoctrination, the events at Sandy Hook unfolded and did the truth start flying my way about what really happened? As we know, December 14th, 2012, some asshole 
Alleged pedophile douchebag. Fuck nut. Shot up Sandy Hook Elementary. Shortly after the fiscal year ends. Keep that in mind. Soon after the shooting, I start to hear about all the deep state and their cover up on testing and blah, blah, blah. I continue to demand actual evidence until one day I get a photo of what looks like a just right enough FBI report that shows Newton, Connecticut is having zero deaths in 2012. Perplexing until you think about the fact that this came out right after Sandy Hook. I've never seen the government organize a report so quickly. I said, maybe they're working off the fiscal calendar like most governments do. I don't hear from this man for months. I tried to locate this document to send it along, but could find no evidence it exists outside of a dead link to it on Alex Jones' website. Deep state cover-up or some bullshit he was court-ordered to remove. Who knows? Maybe someone with stronger Google foo can locate it, but I feel like, shit, like this document, combined with a man on the verge of a psychotic break, does the same amount of damage as most cult leaders. Yeah, more maybe. Probably more. Uh, Now some things about this whole situation. You spoke about wanting answers and closure to situations like this and the Vegas shooting. In my opinion, these guys are assholes, plain and simple. Is there oftentimes underlying mental health issues that can cause chain reactions to form events like this? Uh, is that the only to be the only option in someone's mind? Absolutely. But it also seems very insensitive to people with anxiety and OCD, which the New York Times would claim is a factor for Adam Lanza motive. How many people walk around every day with those issues and don't murder 26 people? I get there's varying degrees of severity, and I'm not here to argue that. Just simply stating, I don't feel like the answer isn't just, he's an asshole most of the time. I also feel like the media tends to glorify the perpetrators of these crimes by showing 24 hours of this person's life for the next three weeks in their manifestos. Personally, I feel like we need to glorify the great people who rose to action during such events. But I also believe in freedom of the press and they're going to do what they're going to do. Also, the weapons used in the shooting belong to Adam's mother who failed to properly secure them away from a person with an underlying mental disorder. But that never gets talked about. Well, sorry for the long email, but if you could give a shout out to crisis actor in the fake country of Australia, my friend Gareth Locke, he's dealing with some heavy stuff at the moment. And hearing from you would likely do him some good. I met him on the OG Time Suck Facebook group, and he seems like a great A meat sack, even if he's fake. And one quick topic suggestion. I've suggested it before, but Major Dick Winters and the boys of the 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment. More people need to know their stories. And the man's name is Major Dick Winters. Come on. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Uh, great message, man. Yeah, every once in a while, Alex Jones and guys like him do get a hold, maybe, of some document that sheds a other, could be something here, light on what they're saying. Uh, which is very unfortunate because then it seems to give credibility in many people's eyes to all of the other batshit stuff that they fucking say. Uh, And as someone who also likes the Second Amendment, I hate that there is a crowd in this country that gives casual and responsible gun owners a terrible name. And you're right. They did not talk enough about how, you know, uh, you know, Adam's mom didn't keep her guns properly locked up with the Orlando nightclub shooting. Uh, That often is the real problem. Not being responsible. Interesting uh, thoughts as well about how, about how, you know, we too quickly maybe point to mental health issues with mass shooters. Why can't they just sometimes be fucking assholes? Uh, I would love to hear that from more prosecutors. Why did so-and-so do what they did? Well, because they're a fucking asshole. World's always had a lot of them. And sometimes one asshole does something especially assholy. And well, here we are. And Gareth Locke, well, I hope life improves in that fake-ass nation of cri- crisis actors th- uh, that you call home in. I mean, just make it improve, right? You're living a fake life in a fake country. So, you know, just change the video game to your, to your liking. It's got to be that simple, right? Uh, in all seriousness, I hope we get down to Australia one of these days. And I hope you all are doing well. And I'll talk to you next week. Next time, suckers. I needed that. We all did. Thanks again for listening to another Bad Magic Productions podcast, Meet Sex. I know this was a big one, but there was just so much to talk about. Uh, I truly hope you don't want to die. But I'm in favor of you being able to make that call if you want to. But please. Explore every other option first. One of those options, you know, to hang around and keep on sucking. Bad Magic Productions. Hey, Joe, do, do we have any turbans around the office anywhere? Um, I haven't seen one recently. I can go look. Yeah, I just need a, okay. I need a, I need a turban and some masking tape. I need you to mask all the light switches off in the building. Okay. I'm going to put on the turban. I'm going to walk around in the dark naked with a boner and, you know, see see how much ghost dick people want. I just think uh, I think it would be a fun experiment. Okay. Out of all those things, I think we have tape and a boner. Okay, so we don't have the turban. So I'll, but I'm, I'll, I'll be right back. I'm going to go look. You get because you can prep up. Okay, prep. I'll, get, I'll get naked. You get the tape. I'll get the boner. Let's get this fucking ghost dick out there to the people. Come on.